Greetings, everyone. How are you? Thank you so much for taking the time to join us. I am Councilwoman Dion Falk, your District 4 Councilwoman, and I am so happy that you took a few minutes out of your time to join us here this evening. We have lots of great information for you. But before we get started, we have a very special guest to my left, our famous Inglewood Mayor, Mayor James T. Butts, and I want to turn it over to him to bring greetings. Mayor Butts. Thank you, Dion. Uh, welcome, everybody, from District 4. We have um, some great presentations by staff and by the councilwoman that will keep you informed and up on what's going on in Inglewood. For those of you that don't know, in addition to the Clippers, the Rams, and the Chargers, we also have the LA Philharmonic Youth Orchestra Program that will open in October right here, not 50 yards from City Hall. The greatest orchestra musicians in the world will tutor about 300 students, and our agreement is that 160 of them, more than half, will be Inglewood students. Also, YouTube and Google are part of the Inglewood partnership as well. YouTube is the sponsor for the 6,000 seat performing arts theater that's attached to SoFi Stadium. Uh, it's a beautiful, beautiful uh, facility. Our the first official act was to have uh, the graduations for Inglewood High Schools there about three or four months ago. And with us today is, is Erica Torres, the county administrator. So we look forward to hearing from her. Also, uh, there are two ballot measures coming up in November for vote, uh, Measure I and Measure H. And there have been a lot of questions, and I wanted to briefly go over them. So Measure I is a real estate transfer tax. Now, right now, every time a property is sold in Inglewood, 55 cents of every thousand goes toward this real estate transfer tax. In Los Angeles, the tax is $4.50 per thousand. In Culver City, it goes as high as $30 per thousand for properties over 10 million. And most every other city is in the $4.50 and higher range. What does this mean to us? This particular measure, when a property sells for more than 1.1 million, more than 1.1 million, that's usually an investor uh, purchase. They're purchasing an apartment building, uh, they're purchasing a commercial property. And so investors are getting away with not paying a fair tax to the city for the, all the investment that's occurring in Inglewood. And so those monies are the monies that we use to pave streets, renew sidewalks, cut trees, so on and so forth. So this is long overdue, and it's coming on the ballot in November. The second, Measure H, is a transit occupancy tax uh, increase from 14% to 15.5%, a 1.5% increase. That's on hotel stays, and that's paid by people that visit our city, uh, use our facilities, and uh, that'll put us about equal with Beverly Hills, Santa Monica, Los Angeles, and other cities. So I want you to understand that uh, this is not a property tax increase for Measure I, it's a real estate transfer that's paid out of the proceeds from the buyer. And so with that, I'm going to turn things back over to uh, Dion Falk, our magnificent councilwoman from District 4, and I want to thank everybody for all the support you've given to uh, the staff that work for you and the council. Thank you very much, Dion. Thank you so much, Mayor. Appreciate that. Um, he always is very good at providing very like succinct information for our residents to understand. And so that is very important information that's going to be coming up on the ballot. So we will also have additional information that will be available to you. All the council members will make sure that we have information via our websites or social media that you can access. Thank you again, Mayor Butts, for, um, for joining us and for your greetings. My pleasure. Um, before we get started, I want to go over the meeting guidelines for everyone. I want to make sure that they understand how we, we will be operating this evening. So uh, by participating in this meeting, you understand that it is being recorded. 
We ask that the Facebook comment section be used only for questions. And then lastly, after each presenter, the questions will be read aloud. And we will move forward with trying to answer at least a couple of questions if we can. We do have a lot of presentations here this evening, a lot of valuable information. So we will try and take as many questions as we can. Next slide. As you can see from this slide, we have, it is packed with great information. We have our chief of IPD that's going to give a presentation. Dr. Torres, our county administrator, will give updates on our school district. We have a Verizon update. We have Gerard McCollum from Wilson Meany that will be giving updates on the Clippers Arena. Uh, Jason Witt from Hollywood Park that will be giving updates. And then we have our city staff, Lewis Atwell, Director of Public Works, and, and his staff, and then Christopher Jackson, Director of Economic and Community Development, as well as Crystal McGlover, Emergency Preparedness Coordinator. So we have a lot of great updates. A lot of these presentations that, um, that my office put together for this evening are related, directly related to the questions that we receive from our constituents. So just wanted to let you know that, uh, that you will get a lot of your questions answered this evening. So real quick, uh, the next slide, please. Um, for your informational purposes, this town hall is uh, specifically to provide you information and updates on what's happening in the city of Inglewood District 4. Um, we will have COVID-19 updates, construction project updates, and then public safety and school district, like I said. But the main purpose of this town hall is to strictly provide information and to get your questions answered. And that's what we plan to do here this evening. Next slide, please. So before we get into these really good presentations, what I'd like to do right now is acknowledge that September and October is a Hispanic National Hispanic Heritage Month. And so because of this, I wanted to highlight my council members. Okay, and so they are here, Eloy Morales and Alice Padilla. They have been very special to me as a new councilwoman coming on board. They have been a wealth of knowledge and support for me, as well as all my other colleagues, but they have just been tremendous with the support that they give. And so I would like to acknowledge them for National Hispanic Heritage Month. Okay. And then also, just in general, I want to, because I am the councilwoman for District 4, I want to acknowledge all my colleagues, um, Mayor James Butts, that just uh, gave brought greetings, and then uh, Councilman Dotson, George Dotson, Eloy Morales, Alex Padilla, and myself. Always, we um, are a great team here. We work well together. And um, I think that that is the magic that makes Inglewood, what it is, is the team effort that we have here now. So um, I just want to really acknowledge them and their efforts. So with that, there's a couple more announcements I have before we get started with the presentations. Um, I want to make sure that everybody is aware that we do have an election coming up on September 14th. And so we have a ballot drop box at our Crenshaw Imperial Library. The address is 11141 Crenshaw Boulevard. So I want to encourage everybody to exercise their right to vote. So make sure you drop your ballots in the mail before or on no later than September 14th. And we have made it convenient. It's right here in District 4 at our library. So make sure you exercise your right to vote. With that, I am going to go ahead and get started with our first presentation for the evening. We have coming up to the mic, Chief Mark Fronterada, Chief of Inglewood Police, and he is going to provide some very important updates on what's happening, what he sees, 
um, happening out there in District 4 and in the city of Inglewood. So go ahead, Chief, and uh, start your presentation. <laughs> and specifically for uh, District 4 is uh, Lieutenant Marvin Aguilar. He is your beat commander. This is uh, broken down and down in the uh, lower right-hand corner is Lieutenant Marvin Aguilar, and hopefully you can see those numbers on there, those phone numbers. We will certainly provide those. So if you're having an issue in the district, you can reach out to this lieutenant, and he will return your calls, and we will uh, troubleshoot the issues at hand and hopefully come to some uh, type of resolution. The other uh, lieutenants that I have assigned, obviously, are in the other districts throughout the, uh, throughout the community. This is a way that you have a direct contact uh, into the police department as well as calling me because many of you do, and I, <laughs> I welcome that. Yeah. Hopefully you can hear me okay <laughs> on that. I'm going to bend down a little bit. Okay. But uh, uh, as you know, I think it's really important to have that direct contact into the police department. And of course, uh, you can always call me. I always answer the phone. Yes, you do. <laughs> Thank you. So, I, uh, you know, when I talk about crime statistics, uh, I'm always a little bit hesitant because, you know, one crime is one too many. And anybody who's a victim of a crime is obviously uh, something that we're all concerned with and for the loved one of that victim. Um, so I say this, you know, with a little bit of reservation. Uh, although I am somewhat pleased to announce that, you know, uh, part one crimes in District 4 are down 18% uh, year to date from last year. Oh, can you repeat that, please, for our District 4 residents? Yeah, that cr Part 1 crimes are down 18% from uh, last year, uh, year to date. That's amazing. So that's serious crime. Uh, again, uh, I would like uh, uh, that number to be zero, but at the end of the day, um, that's something that we can look towards. And certainly, uh, citizens being the eyes and ears out there for us are very, very important. We we partner and collaborate uh, with everyone. Obviously, you can remain anonymous if you wish to in reporting issues to us. Um, I want to emphasize that. You don't have to tell us who you are. If you feel more comfortable doing it that way, we're okay with that. Uh, but most importantly, we want to deliver the services that you need and uh, create a safe environment for everyone. So this is a tool you can you can go online. It's uh, called crimemapping.com. So if you uh, want to play around with it on the internet, you can do that, and um, it'll give you statistics and data from the district or anywhere in the city. That's just a tool on the internet that we provide. So this is uh, our Inglewood uh, mental, mental Health Evaluation Team. Um, I was one of the first chiefs in the county to bring this service uh, directly into the police department. This is a way that we have officers that can interact with the homeless individuals out there, certainly individuals that are suffering from mental illness, and all other types of uh, networking we can do with support services, hopefully uh, assist these individuals with getting them into some form of living arrangement. Um, I also have agreed and house a district mental health uh, manager from the Department of Mental Health in the police department with us. Mm -hmm. uh, she is embedded with us, as well as a uh, caseworker who goes out in the field with our officers. And uh, we just have some incredible stories of individuals that we've helped uh, to assist them into some form of living and uh, you know, getting them off the street. It is very uh, difficult at times, and sometimes the individuals 
uh, elect not to take uh, mm -hmm. advantage of the services that we offer. But my position is, is that we always offer and we continue to offer and do what we can to assist these folks and um, get them into some form of a better living arrangement. Mm -hmm. We call that the IMET team. And this is just a picture of, a, of one of the officers talking to someone who was a little bit down on his luck at that point in time. Right. We actually ended up uh, assisting this individual. So this was a, you know, a positive ending for this case. So the, the next thing I want to do, and I know it's going to be important to you, I'm going to have uh, Captain Cardell Hurrett, uh, who I've put in charge of uh, street takeovers. And I know that's very, uh, there's been a lot of issues with that throughout the city, particularly in District 4. It seems like they've been uh, concentrating on an, the area of Imperial and uh, Yukon. And, right. and, and I, I uh, hope that none of, no one has been got caught in one of these things. Mm -hmm. But we want to explain what this is. I've tasked Captain Hurt uh, with a task force to directly address with this issue, uh, which incidentally is a statewide and actually national uh, mm -hmm. issue. If, if you saw a few weeks ago in a council presentation, I had the CHP, California Highway Patrol in here who was, have assisted us on a few of these operations. Um, but we've also since then put in our own officers and I've had Captain Hurt who's done a good job with this uh, to directly impact uh, what they're doing out there. Mm -hmm. And we do make arrests, we impound vehicles. Last weekend we impounded, I believe, about six or eight vehicles, made a few arrests. And he's just gonna give a, a little more detailed explanation of what they do. Okay. Captain Thank Hurt. you. Okay, I'm gonna bend down a little bit because <laughs> I was watching Thank some you. of the comments Appreciate and people that. were saying that they can't hear. So hopefully you can hear me. Okay. Um, I'm Captain Cardell Hurt. I was raised in District 1, so Inglewood is my home. And thank you, Councilwoman Falk and Chief Honorado, for giving me this opportunity. So I'm just here to talk about uh, street racing. I'm the Patrol Bureau Captain, so I'm in charge of this uh, task force. And I have a short presentation for you. So let me go ahead and uh, cue this up. Point it there. Okay. So right now you're looking at a, a street racer this is not Inglewood. This is uh, from a documentary on Vice, and he's in the middle of the intersection performing his uh, donuts, you know, burning rubbers and all that stuff to kind of excite the crowd. That's a little bit of the crowd that's videotaping him in the middle of the uh, intersection. And uh, this is kind of the phenomenon that we're dealing with now in uh, the city. So I just want to kind of give you an overview of that. But basically, a, a side show is it's basically illegal. We've been having zero tolerance towards it. If we get a call of a street race or an illegal side show in the middle of the intersection, um, a number of officers respond and they know zero tolerance. Um, write tickets, uh, impound cars if people don't have license and et cetera, et cetera. So it impedes traffic. Um, can we go to the next one? Because I think we saw this about three times. <laughs> So essentially, the, the, the photo on the left is uh, basically what the intersection looks like when these uh, illegal car shows happen. It's just a bunch of you know black um, marks on the mm -hmm. on the pavement, and then on the right is an actual street you know illegal side show where people are overtaking the intersection. They're preventing law enforcement from coming in and dealing with the people in the middle of the intersection that are um, performing these acts. These people have lasers, they have a lot of stuff and tactics that try to just um, discourage us from coming in and, and taking action. But we've been putting out a number of officers and um, we've been pretty successful with our operations. So as the chief mentioned, uh, we partnered with the Highway Patrol and here's some pictures from that illegal sideshow. Uh, we impounded cars, we checked emissions on vehicles. It, and then it was an overall great operation uh, with uh, the highway patrol, okay? 
The other, this was at Van Ness in 108th. Mm -hmm. The uh, chief did mention Yukon and Imperial, so District 4. Um, Van Ness at 108th and Yukon and Imperial, but this can happen at any intersection, okay? But that's the two, free, that's the two uh, most frequent intersections that they take over in your district, okay? okay? And I just want to reinforce our, um, our phone number for non-emergency. If you do get in the middle of an intersection and you're wondering, the light's green, we're not going, I'm hearing all this noise and commotion, mm -hmm. it's probably a legal street race, and you can go ahead and call us at that non-emergency number there and uh, it will get an officer to respond to that area, okay? And I'm going to turn it back over to Chief Honor. Thank you. Thank you, Captain. Yeah, and I just want on that, on the uh, <clears throat> street stake, uh, takeover stuff, we take this very seriously. Mm -hmm. uh, the council and the infamous wisdom passed an ordinance a few weeks yes. ago mm -hmm. that will enable us to actually seize vehicles once we properly uh, impound them and we go through the, the legal process to do that, and we will do that uh, if we can legally. Uh, we will take every legal action we can to curtail this type of activity. Uh, I know it's very disconcerting to citizens, um, and if you happen to get caught in one of these things, just remain in your car. Do not get out, um, because the, these people, this is way different than the old car caravans, you know, mm -hmm. and nice looking cars and all that sort of thing. They used to cruise, and, Crenshaw Boulevard and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. This is a completely different phenomenon. Right. And so, um, if again, if you do happen to get caught in one of these things, remain in your vehicle, remain calm. We will be there. Uh, we we will come. Uh, and the other thing is, what might be a little deceiving, we don't send loan officers into this. So it's important to understand that. Even if you call us and you see an officer sitting there, we, we have a plan, but we need a group of officers to go in and address the uh, issue at hand. Okay. So sometimes citizens misunderstand that, think mm -hmm. we're delaying our response or something like that. So I wanted to explain that to everyone so that you had a good understanding of what we're doing. But we, we will come in, but we want to make sure that we come in as a collective force. Okay. They have things that they do, and we, we know that, and mm -hmm. we have to deal with that okay. in a safe manner. All right. And then... Um, as, a, as your chief of police, I would be remiss if I didn't talk about recruitment. Because okay. I always love hiring people from Inglewood. <laughs> and uh, we are hiring. Inglewood PD is hiring. I need good people, people from this community, for all positions within our organization. We need mm -hmm. good people to be police officers, support staff, mm -hmm. uh, records clerks, dispatchers, custody officers, on and on and on. Mm -hmm. So you can go to our website, and please do, and submit an application. And if you are an Inglewood resident, I will put your, your paperwork at the top of the stack. Priority. I love and it. Priority. <laughs> and we will expedite the processing of your paperwork. I love that. So I ask you, please apply. We want you. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Chief. I we am. appreciate your presentation, you and also Lieutenant uh, Cardell Hart. Um, Two takeaways from this presentation um, at District 4 residents. If you see a street takeover happening in District 4, um, what you can do is you can call 310-412-8771 and let IPD, Inglewood Police Department, know that it's happening. And then also, like Chief said, there will be a process to get more officers out there. Don't be alarmed if you see one officer out there and they're not acting. It's because they have a process and they're bringing in uh, backup. So the best thing you can do is just make sure you alert IPD by calling that number. And then also, IPD is hiring. So if you're looking for a job, for a gig, Please, please contact uh, IPD, go to the website, and submit an application. Thank you so much, Chief, for your presentation. Appreciate you. Thank you, Councilwoman, and thank you, residents of District 4. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much. And um, with that, what I'd like to do is next invite our County Administrator of Inglewood Unified School District, Dr. Erica Torres, to come, she's going to give some very important updates on our Inglewood Unified School District. We did start back to school 
last month. So I'm sure she has a few updates for all of our parents out there. So with that, we will um, go ahead and uh, we're going to get started with her. And again, we have Dr. Erica Torres, County Administrator, Inglewood Unified School District, okay. and my friend. I appreciate her so much. Thank you so much, Councilwoman uh, Falk. I really appreciate this opportunity to provide an update to our amazing Inglewood community around reopening of schools. And so I just wanted to mention that we made the very difficult decision to close our schools in March of 2020. And so we have been waiting for this day to welcome all of our students and staff back to our schools. And this evening, I'm going to provide an update on our plans for reopening, what we did to prepare for a safe reopening of schools. I'm going to also talk about instruction, our meal distribution, how we're supporting our students and staff as it relates to social emotional supports before and after school care, and also our testing and vaccination program. What I wanted to start off uh, by saying is that it has been a challenging year for the entire community. Um, our, our state, our nation, our city has been highly impacted by COVID-19. And as educators, we have taken this responsibility very seriously. What we made the decision to do when we closed our schools in March of 2020 is to convene a reopening of schools task force. And we, op we focused on five areas around family and community engagement, health and safety, curriculum and instruction, operations, and social emotional support. I want to thank our entire community for working directly with us, including our parents, our students, our staff, our board members for coming together with us to develop our reopening of schools task force. And I wanted to give a shout out to our amazing board members, Dr. Carlos McGee, our president, Ms. Margaret Evans, our vice president, Ms. Naomi Hammonds, board member, Mr. Brandon Myers, board member, and Mr. Ernesto Castillo, board member, for their ongoing support and commitment to the success of our district. So I just wanted to give some key highlights around health and safety protocols. And what I wanted to start off by saying is that when we decided to close our schools in March of 2020, uh, we began meeting very closely um, and directly with the Los Angeles County Office of Education, the Los Angeles County Department of Public Health, the 80 school district superintendents and cabinet members of Los Angeles County to develop our plan for reopening of schools. And this is based on the guidance from the Los Angeles County Department of Public Health. We also work together to develop our own health and safety plan. This is uploaded on our website at inglewoodusd.com. We also have a school site safety committee at each one of our school sites. And what we have done in preparation for reopening of schools is prepared all of, all of our classrooms um, all of our facilities with social distancing guidelines in mind. And so this slide provides you with a picture of how we have set up our classrooms with the barriers between the desks. We are requiring face coverings for all of our students and staff. Upon entering any of our schools or facilities, we are requiring um, the COVID-19 screenings, including the temperature checks. And we also have the PPE available at all of our school sites and our school facilities. And so this slide here provides you with a picture of our reopening of schools plan, our safety plan and protocols and procedures updated on a regular basis and available on our website. And so as it relates to curriculum and instruction, what I wanted to say is that I'm really proud that we are providing in-person learning. We were providing distance learning for about 17 months. Um, our students are receiving a robust instructional program. We're focusing on grade level standards and we're also offering differentiated supports to our students. 
We also just adopted a new science curriculum and we're focusing a lot on science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. We also implement a social emotional learning curriculum and have various wellness programs available throughout our district. In addition to that, I'm really excited to say that we are partnering uh, with ETMLA, Musicians at Play, and also with the support of our Councilwoman Falk. Um, we're going to be working closely with Yola around music programs for our students. So thank you for that, Councilwoman. So all of our schools are open, our Child Development Center. Uh, this slide provides you with the um, school hours. We're in full operation at all 19 facilities that we have. I'm also very excited to say that we have reopened our athletics programs and we're working closely with our athletic directors, our coaches, to ensure that we continue to adhere to CIF regulations. And it's also important to note that we require that our athletes uh, be tested on a weekly basis, and this is in accordance with LA County Department of Public Health and CIF. I also wanted to share that Senate Bill 130 recently passed. And what this bill does, it, it provides an opportunity for school districts to develop an independent study program for parents that do not feel comfortable with sending their children to school physically. So we are offering this opportunity for parents, and they can reach out to us at inglewoodusd.com for additional details. And this opportunity is available for students of all grade levels, including our students that are in special education, or if our students are English language learners. And I wanted to also highlight our meal distribution program. Um, when we made the decision to close our schools, uh, we immediately transitioned to providing support for our entire community. And we really focused on distributing meals in collaboration with various organizations. And so our meal distribution program um, has returned to normal operations. And what I wanted to highlight is that I'm really proud that effective September 7th, that we will be offering a separate program for all of our students. And this is at no charge. This slide provides an overview of five-day grocery kits that are available for our students that are participating in our independent study program. And we are distributing these kits at five of our school sites, and the names of the schools are on this slide. So we have Highland, Centinella, Bennett Q, Hudnall, and Worthington. Something that we've also focused on as a school district and community is to ensure that we continue to address the social emotional wellness of our students, staff, and families. And so our school counselors, our psychologists, have been really instrumental in addressing the mental health needs. Uh, we also partner with mental health agencies, including Dee Dee Hirsch, Masada Homes, Children's Institute. We also partner and work very closely with the Los Angeles County Department of Mental Health. Um, we also provide comprehensive supports to all of our staff through our EASE program, which is our employee assistance service for education program, which is a free counseling support program for all of our staff. In addition, we provide parent academies and workshops for parents that are interested. We have moved forward with our before and after school care through our ACES program. And so we are providing care for our students between the hours of 7 to 8.15 in the morning before school. And then we also provide breakfast in the morning. And then in terms of additional support after school, we provide support um, and really fun activities from 2 to 6 p.m. Monday through Friday. Um, we will provide the meals to our students in the evening hours, as I've mentioned. And then we are continuing our partnership with the Westchester YMCA to provide additional supports 
and activities for all of our students. Our district is requiring that all of our employees uh, submit proof of being fully vaccinated, or we're also requiring, if they haven't submitted that proof, to be tested at least once per week. And what we have done is we have developed a schedule where every school site um, will offer our testing program. We also offer free vaccines at all of our school sites, and information is uploaded on our website on a regular basis and this is free of charge. And that is my update on reopening of schools for the Inglewood Unified School District. Thank you, Councilwoman Falk, for this opportunity. I really appreciate it. Dr. Torres, just very fascinating the fact that you have highlighted how the last, what was it, 17 months, you had to organize Inglewood Unified School District to be distance learning. and so. Finally, they're back to in-person learning. And I know you've worked so hard to bring our kids back. And so it's just amazing what you've done. And then some of the highlights, I want to make sure everybody caught during her presentation. So they're back to in-person learning. And the schools are open. And also, they have a new science uh, curriculum that they're implementing for all of those special scientists-related kids who want to get out there and, and do their thing in science. And then they've also established a wellness program. And you have some very important partnerships, like with YOLA and also YMCA. So um, I, I just really, really want to acknowledge all the hard work you've done with Inglewood. And I, I think that it is definitely on the right road now. And um, hopefully, we will see an increase in enrollment this year as well. So thank you again for all your hard work, Dr. Torres. I appreciate Torres. the opportunity. Appreciate you. All right. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you again, Dr. Torres. What I'd like to do at this point is bring up uh, Daisy. You're going to kill me, Daisy. <clears throat> Kim Pong from Verizon. So um, we are, just for uh, our District 4 residents, we have some very fascinating updates. Uh, Verizon is one of our partners here in the city of Inglewood. They're working closely with SoFi Stadium and city of Inglewood, Clippers Arena, and all this corporate development happening here. And they're just trying to make sure that everything is done right. So um, I have received a few calls, and so I thought that it would be really good for uh, them to come and provide a few updates as we get ready to move forward, especially with the opening of the SoFi Stadium. So with that, I want to go ahead and turn the floor over to Daisy Kampong from Verizon, who will give us some Verizon updates. Welcome, Daisy. Thank you. Good evening, Council Member Falk. Thank you for the opportunity to allow Verizon to participate in this event tonight mm -hmm. and address um, your council district. And um, I'm Daisy with Verizon, as you mentioned. Mm -hmm. And what we'd really like to share with the city today and its residents is that Verizon is here as a partner. And we've been working with city staff for the better part of two years to try and make sure that we meet the increasing need for wireless in the city. Right. So what we've experienced, not just um, with the pandemic, of course, which has grown the need for wireless in the city, but even before that, um, wireless need has grown exponentially year over year. So, for example, reliability in a crisis is something that Verizon is known for and we're very proud of. Right now, 80% of 911 calls are coming from cell phones. So it's very important for wireless connectivity to be there in emergency situations especially. In addition to that, we're seeing increase in use, uh, access to medical care, access to education, as well as access to city services. So what I, as um, Dr. Torres was speaking earlier, remote learning, that increased definitely the need for wireless connectivity because people are using, especially children, using their laptops and, um, and other um, wireless uh, units to devices to connect. In addition to that, um, access to healthcare has grown exponentially with the telehealth um, usage growing um, by about 64.3 is the projection year over year. So that's an increase that, first of all, prior to the pandemic was not anticipated. <laughs> and then, um, so, but Verizon has been building to try and meet that need. 
finally, city services are more and more online nowadays. Mm -hmm. So a lot of um, residents are relying on information that they get for their daily needs to connect with the city and city services via wireless means. And of course, we're very excited to say that we're building also for the city of Inglewood for the Super Bowl. Yes. So we are uh, definitely um, doing a lot more in the city to be able to meet the needs of the visitors that are anticipated to celebrate the Super Bowl in February of 2022. And we're excited about that, Daisy. Yes, <laughs> and so are we. Yes. And so what we're doing as a wireless company is basically we're approaching wireless in different ways, right? We try to do a balanced approach. So we have what we call macro sites, as well as small cells, as well as DAS systems. And what they all do is they do different things in different areas. So what you can see on the screen here is we have those blue um, uh, circles, which are the wider range. Those are from our macro sites, basically. So they have a wider range of reach and are able to cover a lot more area. Now we have our small cells, which I will talk about a little bit more in a little bit. Our small cells have a shorter reach, so those are the yellow circles that you're looking at. And then we also have our DAS system, which are going to be inside the stadium and the events areas that where there are a lot of people trying to connect at the same time. So what we're trying to avoid is that um, when, where there's large gatherings of people, that you will basically see the buffer, the circling buffer of death. We don't want that to ever happen. So we want you to be able to connect quickly and be able to share your experiences with people. So that's what we're doing. In addition to that, the small cells is really what a lot of your residents are seeing in the area. So what are small cells? Small cells are the smaller version of what we call our macro towers. Drive down the freeway, you see a monopine, you, um, basically our faux trees, or you see rooftops with antennas. The small cells are the smaller version of that. And just like macros, they need power, they need radios, antennas, and fiber. So in addition to Verizon investing in the infrastructure in the city, we're also building a lot of fiber. So you will see a lot of happening um, as far as in the streets. We're trying to work efficiently and work with city staff to make sure that we're causing the least amount of disruption. But you can see here one of our examples of our um, city streetlights. Uh, we basically replace the city streetlights in conjunction with um, so Southern California Edison. And so the streetlight will still function as a streetlight, but it's also able to act as a cell site. So um, it doesn't add additional infrastructure into the right of way, and we brought the latest design to Inglewood. So we're very proud of that design. We also do installations on wood poles. And the wood poles are, again, existing infrastructure in the city. And what we do is we either um, add new antennas to the wood poles or um, we replace them and um, basically make sure that they're structurally safe to accommodate antennas. So council member, that's essentially what we're doing in Inglewood. We're, we're um, in every corner of the city. We're very proud of what we've done. Um, we're very appreciative of all the hard work that the staff has been um, helping us with uh, trying to make sure that the wireless connectivity continues. And we thank you for this opportunity. Thank you so much. Before you go, I just want to check in and see if we have any questions for you um, at all. I'll check in with my assistant. Are we, any questions? So yes, I think that we have, my office has received some questions. Are there any health related challenges with these uh, cell towers, if you can address that for us? Sure. Um, our cell sites are designed to be in compliance with all FCC guidelines. So they're designed to operate safely. And everything that we do, uh, we make sure there are different steps along the way to make sure that they operate in such a way. So as part of our submissions into public works, we actually provide um, safety reports to show that whatever we're proposing for a particular location um, will meet those guidelines. Okay. And um, if there's any residents, we, we would be happy to share that information as well, as well as additional links to um, third parties like say the FCC and the FDA that they can go into so that they can deep dive into the information. But the bottom line is we operate our cell site safely according to the FCC standards. And, um, and we strive and make sure that that happens with every site every day. Okay, thank you. So residents, um, if you have any other questions regarding uh, health-related uh, questions for Verizon, you can feel free to email my office and we will provide you the information directly from Verizon so that you can read it for yourself. 
and um, make sure that you educate yourself on what what the real health related issues could be. But thank you so much for answering that question. I do know that we do have a couple of other questions regarding um, if there's any interference. We have the wonderful corporate development that's happening in Inglewood, and we do have remote learning now, and then we have an increase in, in so many different areas. And so I do sometimes get questions from residents, uh, especially those um, – like uh, near the new entertainment district. And so I don't know if you want to address anything there or anything. Are there any special measures that you guys are looking at to make sure that all of our residents receive uninterrupted, you know, uh, service as well as providing ultimate care for our new uh um, entertainment district coming in to District 4? Of course, uh, Council Member. Thank you for the question. Mm -hmm. um, yes, uh, our team at Verizon is constantly testing around the city, especially right now where we're building a lot of sites. So there, um, I, I will say that perhaps maybe they will experience certain interruptions mm -hmm. as we're trying to build sites around the area. But for sure, what we can do is that if somebody does experience um, a disruption in their service and they're a Verizon customer, mm -hmm. um, we'd be more than happy to, to, to look into an area for them of concern okay. and see if there's a root cause to it. Mm -hmm. But um, we're very proud to say that our network is very solid and reliable, and uh, we're constantly winning root metrics. So Inglewood is the best example of that area. Oh, yeah. well, thank you. We're so happy to have you as a partner here in Inglewood. Inglewood is an exciting city, and so to see a large company like Verizon come in and want to partner with us is just so exciting. And I'm, I'm so glad that you had an opportunity to participate in this town hall and get those questions addressed by our residents. So thank you so much for coming in, and we will definitely look to get information for our residents as they contact my office for different questions. We're always here for you. Please let us know whatever you need, and we'll be happy to find the answers if we don't know it right away. That is awesome. I love our new partner. <laughs> thank you so much, Daisy. Thank really you. appreciate you. And thank you, residents. <laughs> yes, thank you. Um, so that's a fabulous new partner that we have that's come into the city, and we'll be working to make sure that all of our residents have the best service um, as we move forward with this new Inglewood that we have going. And so um, with that, I want to now turn it over to our Mr. Gerard McCullum. He is with Wilson Mimi, and he will pre be providing some updates on the Clippers Arena. He is um, very, very helpful. I always have questions about what's going on, and he's always there for me, especially as a new council member. So I really, really appreciate uh, Gerard, and, and he's going to go ahead and provide those updates on the Clippers Arena for us. So welcome, Gerard. Thank you so much, Councilwoman. Uh, greetings, everyone, from Wilson Maney. We've been doing these projects for quite some time in the city of Inglewood. And we're proud to finally announce that after a four-year journey, uh, we are about to start construction. You're seeing right now on the site at the corner of Century and Prairie, the beginning of the utility infrastructure that will ultimately support uh, the new Clippers Arena. So just to go briefly over a presentation we've given probably for the last four and a half years at this point, um, I'm going to just give some of the highlights about what the arena will be about and then some of the opportunities that will be presented and that we're working on for, with uh, both job opportunities and also um, construction-based mm -hmm. uh, uh, um, programs as well. Uh, this is the uh, design of the, uh, of the uh, new arena. It is to be to basically match what's kind of going on here right now for SoFi Stadium in terms of a world-class design um, uh, arena. It's designed by AECOM. Uh, it is the same folks that are working on the Olympics worldwide for the last 25 years. And so this is to be really a signature, another signature building uh, for the city of Inglewood. In what you're seeing in this design here is basically two structures within the, the design, the stadium itself and then also the Clippers audio, uh, offices as well. So the idea behind this is to actually relocate all of the uh, services and and uh, uh, 
uh, programs that the Clippers have spread throughout Los Angeles County. As you know, the practice facility currently right now is in Culver City. Their offices are in downtown Los Angeles. And then the arena they share as the third tenant with the uh, uh, Lakers and uh, Sparks. Uh, so this will bring everybody to the site, uh, which means that beyond just uh, uh, game days, you'll have workers on the site, opportunities for jobs beyond just arena-based jobs, also available to the, to the uh, residents as well. Uh, here's another just showing the revision of what the corner of Century Prairie in Prairie will look like. We're envisioning a very large public space that will operate and be available to the residents beyond uh, just the game days. Uh, we'll have a significant public art program in that plaza. We're looking to really install local artists and uh, signature artists around the, the world uh, to be a part of the project. So we're working on that right now, and I'm actually happy to be a part of that. Um, the arena will sit 18,000 seats. Um, I was hoping the number would be 17505 for us old timers here. As you remember, that was what Chick Hearn used to say when he was calling the uh, Lakers game. But it's 18,000 seats will be what the, the arena will uh, accommodate. 85,000 square feet practice facility and an athletic training facility will also be a part in that dome, if you will. 71,000 feet of team offices. So they'll be actually available office space for other corporations as we sort of get to the build out. Uh, there'll be a sports and medical clinic for obviously the players that's kind of associated with most arenas. And then 48,000 feet of retail and dining space associated with the arena as well. Uh, parking facilities and two parking structures and surface parking lots. We are also proud to announce we will be doing a, um, a TNC lot. That's basically, as opposed to having the Ubers just all in, right. all over the place, they will be concentrated into one spot, organized and pretty efficient, similar to if you've ever tried to take uh, an Uber or Lyft from uh, the airport. Mm -hmm. You have to go to one facility. It's right. organized. It moves people in and out. And so that's going to be a significant investment that we're going to make and make that available beyond just actually uh, the Clippers ga game, game days as well. Um, I love that. Yeah, that's a big, mm -hmm. you know, um, you know, we are making a pretty big investment uh, kind of going forward. We have a very significant traffic study mm -hmm. and we've been watching actually what's been going on. Uh, we're investing over $12 million just into the local structure itself to improve overall traffic flow. We're investing also out into the city of Los Angeles, so people coming in and out will have great access and improved uh, direct access. We are doing a tr uh, full traffic study. As you know, it's probably the one of the most expensive one in the state of California to actually understand exactly how we're going to mitigate and actually handle traffic. So our goal is to open six months prior to, do test runs uh, prior to actually having game days so that we could be better be prepared for um, future traffic obligations. Um, this arena is 100% public financed. It is no, I mean, private finance. There's no public dollars <laughs> Say that again. whatsoever. 100% <laughs> privately financed, um, uh, you know, which is a big deal. These arenas before in the past were never done like that before. And through the wisdom of the city, I've been here for a while, you know, it was to attract these type of businesses, but it was very clear that there was no obligation that was to come from the residents. And so everybody had to bite the bullet and decide if they were coming here, mm -hmm. uh, they had to 100% privately finance these buildings. Uh, uh, construction is scheduled to begin in 2021. We almost missed 2021. As again, we started the public, public utilities are now doing the relocation at the site and we are uh, scheduled to start sometime in, in September. So look in your local newspapers, your Inglewood Todays and your local councilman news uh, letters, you'll start to see things about job fairs. And we've been having job fairs actually right. earlier yeah and subcontractor fairs and opportunities for you to get uh, a part of the project. I am very proud to be a part of this project in that it, um, we have a 30% local hire, which is kind of standard, mm -hmm. and also 35% uh, earmark for ear, uh, permanent jobs post operation. I'm sorry, what was that percentage for? 35% mm -hmm. is our goal when the construction is done and we're moving forward. And then we have a goal of employing 30% minority owned and disadvantaged businesses during operation. I want to pause there for a moment. Mm -hmm. That provision you see everywhere. 
And it really is incumbent upon whoever the owner of these projects are to be able to actually make that 30% happen. Mm -hmm. A lot of times, you know, I get contacts from different state projects. They just check the box because they said, oh, I contacted Gerard about possibly working on a project somewhere up in Sacramento. I'm not going to Sacramento. But they checked the box and said, we try because it was a goal. This is a project in which Mr. Balmer said to us, we want to stretch the goal to making that 30% a reality. So what it's doing for us is we're breaking every package apart and looking at how we can actually take these large packages, break them down into small elements in terms of to give more people opportunities to participate and to joint um, venture partnership, participate with the large contractors, subcontractors, so they get an opportunity to learn what this type of construction looks like and to then be able to work on other large projects. We're not the last. Airport is continuing to expand. You've got possibly a transit system kind of going in. It's going to keep going. And so the opportunity to get in now is what we're trying to present. And we're trying to create uh, 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 avenues to be able to get the smaller guys into these large projects. And I'm just really proud because I've done this for a while. And usually it's kind of a do your best. Mm -hmm. No, this is actually we have a team of people designed and trying to figure out how we can do more than our best and try to make this actually happen. So that's one of the prouder elements I have right, about the actual project. That. Um, beyond that, this is the stuff we always talk about that's a reality but kind of goes undercover in terms of what's the economic impact. Those properties over there have been mostly empty. 85% of those properties have been empty for anywhere from 25 to 30 years, generating zero tax revenues uh, and nothing to the schools or the various taxing entities, right? Um, and so, you know, this arena from time when it opens will generate over $100 million in a 25-year period in estimated taxes to the city and local services. Um, we are also doing the largest community benefits package I'm aware of by any private entity in, um, in the United States. We're doing a $100 million community benefits package uh, with a $75 million geared towards affordable housing programs, uh, $5 million to first home uh, buyers and renters, and $20 million towards youth and family pro programs. Uh, and that program we're working now with the city in terms of how that's going to look, what local partnerships can be a part of that program as we develop that and move that forward over the life of the project. The other part, too, is that I'm very proud to announce we will be doing a net zero greenhouse gas program, and we are really taking that beyond the regulations that are required. Um, we will have one of the largest solar panel generating uh, um, um, arrays on the top of this arena. As you saw, the kind of panels that are on top of the arena generating over a million um, kilowatt hours of electricity a year. And we're going to do 1,000 trees throughout the city, uh, EV, high-powered EV charging stations. We're going to assist as the city starts to uh, change over to, to electric vehicles with providing residents opportunities to get reimbursements for some of their uh, um, charging stations. We're going to do all those type of programs, but we're doing things outside of that. We're not only addressing greenhouse gases, we're addressing also uh, NOx and PM 2.5. That's the heavy particulates that come into the area that nobody's really started to address. So we're retrofitting. Um, a lot of that comes from the uh, port area. So we're retrofitting um, some of those heavy diesel boats that are in the port, ports area. And so we have about a 12 to $15 million investment there as well. Um, so we're really being con con conscious of really how can we be additive to the experience beyond what you see um, in, in the project here. Again, we talked about the traffic mitigation program. We've been working on that for a number of years. We're going to continue to work with that. And we'll be uh, really excited when we get to 2024 when this opens um, to, in to introduce that, that program. I'll speed up here. Uh, 7,000 jobs, approximately 18,000 seats, uh, tax revenues. Again, we said $100 million uh, towards that. Um, NBA games are in, and community events are expected to generate an estimated $260 million in overall activity for the Inglewood an annually. So there's a lot of opportunities beyond this. These are the supportive businesses that have lined and have worked over the number of years uh, along Century, Prairie, 
you know, Manchester, et cetera, all the supportive services will get an upswing from what's going to come into the area here. Um, the construction phase alone is the $450 million in wages uh, just will be generated by the construction project alone. Um, I'm going to we've already talked about water savings, 40% zero race program, 330 electric vehicle chargers on site, 1,000 new trees into the city. Uh, we're really trying to be really uh, environmental friendly towards this project. And that concludes my presentations. I don't know if you have any questions. Amazing. But I, I'm so excited about uh, oh, the Clippers Arena coming into Inglewood. I think that is, I mean, I'm sure our residents can see by your presentation how beneficial it's going to be yes. for our city. And I love the $100 million benefits package that's going to benefit our kids and our facilities, our Inglewood facilities. So. It's just um, wonderful, and I can see you're passionate about it. I am very passionate about this. You know, the owner of this uh, arena has been in Inglewood for quite some time that people don't know. Mm. The Vision to Learn program mm. at the school district, Right. Mm. Uh, that program was tested and run out of the owner, Steve Ballmer, wow. um, mm. for years. And that program actually expanded to now the entire uh, uh, Los Angeles Unified School District as well as in Inglewood School District mm -hmm. and provides basically vision uh, services for kids uh, from the time they enter public school to the time they exit public schools. Right. They found through studies that sometimes kids have difficulty learning because they just don't have access to, to corrective vision. Right. And so they right. provide free glasses and exams every year throughout their program. So I'm really excited. It's a great ownership. It's a great partnership, I believe, with the city of Inglewood. And you're a great representative. For Thank that. you. Thank you so much for coming right. here and presenting on that. We really appreciate you, Gerard. All right. Thank you again. Great information for everyone. I hope you all have your your pencils and, and paper with you and you are writing down all of the great information we are receiving here. Um, we have one more outside presentation that we're going to do um, here before we get into our city staff presentations. We have brought on our SoFi Stadium representative, and his name is Jason Witt. I know a lot of our residents probably already know who Jason Witt is, but um, I like to call him the man of SoFi. He's always there to answer questions and provide information for District 4 residents. So, of course, we had to have him come and give some updates from SoFi. So thank you so much, Jason, for being here this evening. And I'm going to go ahead and turn the floor over to you. Very welcome, and thank you very much, Councilwoman. I appreciate the invitation and uh, appreciate District 4 for having me. <laughs> right here? Perfect. All right. I've been hearing folks saying, speaking to the mic, so I'm going to do that. <laughs> All right. So quick overview, go over introduction myself. We'll talk a little bit about SoFi Stadium um, and then start talking about some of the new things uh, to come, some of the present and the future. So YouTube Theater, uh, we'll talk a little bit about the retail and then we'll start talking about jobs and hiring fairs and some of the community initiatives that we have. So I know this is the, the kind of the anchor of Hollywood Park, uh, the 60 acres for which SoFi Stadium sits on. Um, we've heard much about SoFi Stadium so far, um, so I'll touch briefly on it, but I did want to give kind of an overview about Hollywood Park. Um, so Hollywood Park is essentially gonna, is split up into three phases, and what you're seeing right now is phase one. All right, so phase one uh, includes 314 residences, uh, 380,000 square feet of office space, um, where you see the what we call the NFL building. There's also a um, rentable or leasable office space in there and then 500,000 square feet of retail space. Um, and then also Lake Park, which is essentially 12 and a half acres of, of soon to be public park space uh, that the city of Inglewood and adjoining uh, cities and neighborhoods will be able to enjoy. So when we talk about phase one, that's what we're in right now. And that's Hollywood Park. So um, like we said, 380,000 square feet office, retail 500,000 square feet residences, and then Lake Park. So think about that for phase one, and then we'll touch a little bit on each of those different phases here as I move forward. So SoFi Stadium, 
what we know about it, right? So it's the largest stadium in the NFL at 3.1 million square feet of event space, uh, fully covered semi-transparent ETFE roof canopy, 70,000 seats plus, uh, expandable up to 100,000 once we start utilizing field seating and um, some other methods for which we can fit people in the building. Um, and it's next to our two and a half, 2.5 acre American Airlines Plaza, um, which then adjoins you to YouTube Theater. So that roof canopy actually covers three separate event spaces. It's pretty cool because you can see it from beautiful. You can see it from the window here. This oh nice. yes, we can. <laughs> we can see um, it. So when we start talking about um, Hollywood Park, um, this is like the first phase, as I mentioned. So SoFi Stadium um, here being the anchor point right now as we start to build out the rest of the site. Um, you have American Airlines Plaza, as I mentioned, roughly 60,000 square feet of event space. And then YouTube Theater, which we'll talk a little bit about as well. Um, so I did want to address some upcoming events that are becoming the SoFi Stadium. Um, so you have the NFL season. We do house two NFL teams, the Los Angeles Rams and the Los Angeles Chargers. Um, so they will be having games just about every Sunday, uh, one Monday and one Thursday uh, this year. So definitely keep your eyes open for the NFL schedules. Um, you should have received a, a, some information through the councilwoman and, and staff here about what that schedule looks like. Um, the whole goal is to just provide as much information up front as possible about these schedules and um, just to let people know what they can anticipate as far as the events that are going to be coming to SoFi Stadium in Hollywood Park. So uh, also the Rolling Stones coming Sunday, October 17th. You'll have our LA Bowl, which will feature the number one Mountain West team versus the number five Pac-12 team. Uh, that'll be Saturday, December 18th. Uh, as we've mentioned earlier, the Super Bowl, Super Bowl 56, will be Sunday, February 13th, 2022. And then uh, Kenny Chesney is scheduled to be in the, in the building on Saturday, July 23rd. So now we'll talk a little bit about YouTube Theater. So YouTube Theater, we actually just had our ribbon cutting about a couple weeks ago for YouTube Theater. This is a 6,000 seat, 227,000 square foot, three-story indoor venue. All right, so a very, very, uh, uh, just an awesome building um, that we really look forward to having. Um, you know, some more intimate types of events inside of the, uh, inside of YouTube theater. So for kind of a little bit of background or perspective, if you will, um, the furthest seat is 164 feet from the stage. So that's actually, if you, if you, you know, start looking at some, some different theaters and venues, extremely close, the farthest seat back is actually pretty, pretty close to the stage. Uh, so you get a really good feeling for, for being in the building. Um, as we utilize a lot of our vertical space inside. Um, there's a, a lot of fun interactive pieces that come with YouTube theater. So interactive digital wall that's on the interior, which you'll see a picture of here. Um, there's an immersive digital signage display that's on the actual grounds in American Airlines Plaza. Um, and then there's interior and exterior balconies. So um, one of the things you'll hear a lot about Hollywood Park as a whole is that it wasn't meant uh, it wasn't meant just to be a space for football, you know, SoFi Stadium and Hollywood Park. It was meant to be a place that people can enjoy 365. So that whole goal, meaning um, the public park space, uh, the stadium for events, large scale and small. You have YouTube theater seating 6000, which will house things like TED Talks and uh, esports gaming. Um, you know, looking forward to the many different types of events that we can house inside of that intimate 6,000 seat space um, and then use it for our events, for community. So um, there's a lot of rentable spaces and spaces that we want to be able to use for public use um, at SoFi Stadium and Hollywood Park as a whole. So we'll just look at some of the fixtures. So this is the, the third. So this is the third floor balcony um, from one of the in interior bars that you look at here. Um, that will overlook American Airlines Plaza into SoFi Stadium. Um, so yeah, another just in Beautiful. incredible spaces. Um, so actually our first, and there will be a schedule that pops up, but the first show is uh, actually September 3rd, tomorrow, the Black Comedy Festival. So um, this building is about to really start getting some use. Um, so highly encourage everyone, if you're interested in um, any of the shows that are out there, take a look at youtubetheater.com, and you can see some of the listing of the shows. This is a shot of the interior club space. Um, so, you know, there's, there's lots of different ways to interact with the building. Um, I, like I said, we want to be able to use it 365 for, um, you know, private events, birthday parties, dinners, 
all the whole nine. So um, we wanted to just show off a little bit of some of what some of the premier spaces look like. And then here's that interactive wall that seat that's right there at uh, right through American Airlines Plaza. Um, obviously, YouTube being a, a fantastic partner of ours, um, really wanted to push the, the 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 ability to use the technology. Um, so the sound system, the the video displays are incredible, um, and we really can't wait to show those off. Upcoming events. So it's jam packed, <laughs> and this is just through October. <laughs> so, um, like we said, September third, the Black Comedy Festival. Um, Kaifanis is coming in. Um, so uh, yeah, I'm not going to go through all of these, but please take a look and, um, you know, just realize that there's, it's definitely going to be a very interesting time over at SoFi Stadium and Hollywood Park, YouTube Theater, Lake Park, you know, all of the above as we start moving into the months. Um, lots of incredible artists coming in to, to perform. Um, and it really provides a lot of opportunities for us to engage with them um, and really just start bringing in some different diverse, um, diverse talent. I think that was one of the, that's one of the goals that we had was to, um, really push the fact that we're going to bring a lot of diverse talent, uh, here into Inglewood and make sure that we're very well represented in that fact. All right. So we'll talk a little retail. So the retail section which you'll notice we talked about 500,000 square feet, roughly looking at uh, spring of 2022 to Q3 of 2022, fully opening that retail section. Um, it's going to be just phenomenal. So the whole goal of that was to bring, you know, you're going to hear a lot of those of words that I said, like diverse, right? Um, and it's, a, it's, uh, it's, it's intentional. That's an intentional word we're using is because the whole goal is to bring a multitude of different types of businesses, um, a multitude of different types of um, uh, niche, if you will. The, we don't want to just bring in the same old things that every other city has. You know, Inglewood is special, so it should be treated as such. Right. So we wanted to make sure that we brought in a lot of um, things that you can't get anywhere else. You know, when people come to Hollywood Park, um, they're going to see things here in Inglewood that they can't get anyplace else. So that was one of the intentions behind our retail. Um, so some of the tenants that we've announced that are moving in, Three Weavers Brewery, which is a, a Inglewood Brewing Company, um, they'll be opening up a shop here at Hollywood Park. Um, Sky's Gourmet Tacos will be moving in. Um, Antijitos Martin will have a space there as well. Um, Luxury Cinema uh, Sinopolis will be moving in, so everyone can get their very cushy leather seats and recline while they watch the latest uh, Fast and the Furious 13 um dying right <laughs> dying too that's right that's right uh iconics fitness center will be moving in um and then recently announced was residence art gallery so resident residency if you know is had has, has, has a space in um in inglewood they're going to be opening up their art gallery um another space a second inglewood location on hollywood parks uh campus now so um like i said very just excited um to see all that is to come as far as that retail location um like I said, looking at Q2, Q3 of 2022 um, to be fully opened. And some other just, you know, flashing some images here um, about some of the future pieces that you can expect to see. Um, basketball court. So talking about places that the public can interact outside of just game days and event days. Like that was the whole point. Um, when you talk about Lake Park and when we start talking about the retail as it starts to develop in phase one, um, it was really important and intentional that we found ways for the community to engage with Hollywood Park outside of the, the typical um, events that are going to be there. Shopping, so, you know, plenty of shopping and, um, you know, spaces, definitely having a lot of conversations with multiple um, retailers and outlets who want to come in. Um, but like we said, we definitely want to make it feel like home while we're here, while also giving you um, just one of a kind things that you won't be able to experience anywhere else. And it's going to be beautiful. I mean, that's kind of the other people. Some people have been able to drive onto the site for some of the early preseason games and have seen some of the things that we're doing. So, um, you know, the, the whole campus is really going to be meant to be used uh, 365. So we're just, you know, very much so looking forward to um, having that time come soon. I know everyone's asking, when is that going to be, Jason? Soon. <laughs> it is going to happen soon. All right. So. Um, we definitely just want to make sure there's still a lot of construction that is going on at the, at the campus right now, safety being one of our number one priorities. So um, we definitely want to make sure that when our doors do open, 
um, fully to the to the public that it's a safe environment that everyone can can enjoy themselves at. So another piece that I definitely want to highlight before I step down, uh, hiring fairs. So we need a lot of people. We are hiring actively, actively, actively hiring. We need about 2,500 more folks uh, inside of the stadium for, to work. Um, and we're talking about their part-time jobs. There are full-time jobs as well. Um, but event day staff is really critical to what we do. Um, so you're talking football games. You're talking concerts. Um, and as you saw, some of the lineups for YouTube theater, um, we need those positions as well. People who are going to be working in the premium spaces, um, ushers, ticket takers, cashiers, um, a, a whole multitude of different um, job seekers are what we're looking for. So um, we do host hiring fairs every Tuesday and Thursday from 5 to 7 p.m. Um, please visit our website, um, hiring fairs. You can visit hiring fairs at Hollywood Park or hiringfairs.hollywoodpark.com to get information. Happy to share that with the council as well as they've been uh, promoting and pushing a lot of our job fairs for us. Thank you very much because um, we want to get the information out there for folks. Um, but yes, take a look at this. Take a snapshot, if you will. August 31st, September 2nd, the 7th, the 9th, 14th, 16th, 21st, 23rd, 28th, and 30th. I don't want anybody to tell me that, Jason, you didn't have enough dates for job <laughs> fairs and I couldn't make it. Right. Right. <laughs> but from 5 to 7 p.m., we'll be hosting those. The one on September 9th will be from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. All right, so a much larger window to come through. Um, that's next week, Thursday. So um, as we're saying, there's, there's a lot of opportunities for hiring. You will be looking at hiring managers. You'll be talking with directly hiring managers. Um, so as we say, come correct, you walk away with a job. So... Uh, <laughs> We're really looking for people to come on out. Um, like I said, hiring fairs every Tuesday and Thursday, 5 to 7 p.m. All right. And then happy to answer any, any yes, questions. Yes, yes. So um, I will tell you that um, everybody I talked to is so excited. And I want to thank you for reaching out to District 4 residents and inviting them to the tours that you have been doing over the last several months. And so I don't know if those tours are still going or not. I know that there's some residents that reached out and wanted to know that. Do you, do you have any updates on the tours that were, that were going for residents? They can always send information to engagement at hollywoodpark.com. Okay. Engagement at hollywoodpark.com. All right, great. And so, um, and I um, checked in, didn't really see uh, too many other questions, but I know that one of the topics that come up with SoFi is um, residents want to know the schedule. And so I know you've shared that with us. We're posting it on the web page and making sure residents get it. And so um, we just want to keep them up to date on uh, some of those big events that will be happening uh, just so that they can plan for any type of um, traffic coming in or leaving their homes. So, um, But thank you so much for providing that schedule. And I know you'll continue to keep us updated on the schedules so that we can add those to our calendars. Will do. And I do appreciate those who have reached out. I, I will tell you that, you know, no comments go unread or unanswered. You send them in and we definitely take them in and, and have discussions. Um, one, we did get a, we did get an email from someone saying about alerts. Like, can you add yourself to the alert schedule right. um, that send out the text messages? And I think probably in two days we had that done and we were now, we were on the alert schedule for traffic. So, oh, really? okay. yeah. So I just mean like this, this, the, we definitely hear and listen to all of these things. And like I said, we thank you, uh, Councilwoman and obviously Mr. Atwell and his team for the collaboration because that's what it's all about. You know, we have to work together in order to kind of make this whole train run because it doesn't work without you and it doesn't work without us. So, right. you know, and it doesn't work without the residents. Right. So that's why, you know, getting that information, just want everybody to know we hear it and we, and we take it in and we, uh, you know, we have conversations about it to make sure we can do everything we can to, to, you know, make every time we're interacting better and better and better. So thank you very much. Well, thank you so much. Appreciate you. Thank you. Appreciate you so much. And uh, thanks for coming in and giving those updates on SoFi Stadium. More than and we'll welcome. be talking to you soon. And so with that, those are, uh, that ends our outside presentations. Now we're going to, uh, get to a lot of the meat of, um, some of the specifics, um, and answer some of the questions from residents for our, um, uh, city, um, concerns or whatever. So we're going to first bring up Lewis Atwell. 
director of public works, and he has a great presentation. We have um, a, a few different topics that uh, we've asked him to address, and then we will take your questions. So please, if you have any questions for um, Mr. Atwell, please type those into the chat, and I will get those, and we'll make sure that uh, we get at least a few of them answered. We do have a few more presentations, and I want to be um, respectful of everybody's time, but we're going to try and address some of those big topic areas that all of you guys have um, wrote to my office about. So I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to our director, Louis Atwell, and let him get started with his presentation. Thank you, Councilwoman Falk. Um, just a little quick tidbit. Uh, last time I saw Jason Witt, who's now leaving, he was on your District 4 Zoom meeting, yes. and his children were climbing right. all over him, right. and he was trying to give his so presentation. Cute. It was, was the greatest so presentation yes. I've ever seen, <laughs> so I thought I'd uh, mention that one. I love it. Well, love it. actually, it was a good segment um, mm -hmm. because with these stadiums and arenas, there's traffic that's There's generated. traffic. So now we're going to get to the meat of it, right. residents. Yes. And, and just to give a little perspective, um, on a sold-out event, Literally half of the population of Inglewood, mm -hmm. even though Inglewood is probably not going to the event, is coming to the event. Right. So it's 60, 70, 80,000 people. Right. So uh, with that, I'll continue. So my presentation tonight is about the traffic management and operations plan. Okay. It's something that the city uh, works with the stadium on mm -hmm. implementing. And we try our best to handle the traffic, uh, but it is a learning process. Uh, a little bit about uh, Inglewood's transformation. Uh, we had in 2014, we had the LAX Crenshaw line begin construction. Uh, currently, they're testing that line. Eventually, hopefully soon, it will be in service. And then, of course, the forum uh, was revitalized uh, by Madison Square Garden back in 2014 as well. And in 2016, we have the uh, SoFi Stadium coming on board, which Jason Witt talked about. And then in 27, we started construction, or at least the environmental phases, on the LA Clippers arena, which Gerard McCollum spoke about. So with uh, all those things, they do generate traffic, except for the LA Crenshaw line, which helps it. Mm -hmm. So the city is responsible for the off-site uh, traffic mitigation. Um, a little bit about the offsite. Uh, the city controls the traffic signals. During an event, we're in a um, control room uh, controlling the traffic signals. Uh, we also um, implement the bus transit facility, which is also known as the Inglewood Transit Facility or Intermodal Transit Facility. And that is on site. Um, the city owns the property. It's four acres. And it's a extremely large parking lot where buses come in, shuttle buses, and I'll get into a little bit more about that later on the, in the uh, presentation. We also do uh, traffic control. Um, we work with LAS Parking to provide uh, traffic control officers and also A-plus parking for the cones and signs. Uh, we institute off-site parking, so there's a shuttle program. Um, there's in fact, at the last couple events, we shuttled 5,000 uh, fans for those events for each one. And I'll get into a little bit more about that as well. And then, of course, the departments involved. We have the Parking and Traffic Control Division, the Police Department, and the Public Works Department. And then what Jason Witt was kind of mentioning um, about the stadium, but uh, the stadium also controls traffic. So what happens on the stadium site does affect the off-site. Mm -hmm. Because if there's a massive amount of traffic on site, it begins to back up onto city streets. And at that point, the city really can't control the traffic because it's a, essentially the bottleneck is on site. Mm -hmm. So they do have parking on site. I believe they have about 10,000 spaces. Uh, they process the vehicles as they come in. And it includes checking to see what parking lot they go to or if they have parking passes at all. If they don't have a parking pass, they have to do a U-turn back into the traffic, which can be very difficult on the already congested streets. Uh, they provide wayfinding signage on site, and also they control the TNC, which was mentioned er earlier by um, Gerard McCollum, the Uber, Lyft, and taxis. And that's located at, at Kareem uh, and Pinkai. Mm -hmm. 
So the offsite traffic management operations plan, um, you can see some examples of it on the right. Uh, the, um, the shuttle and vehicle ingress and egress routes. So what we do is we try to specify certain routes for shuttles so they can enter the, um, the site much quicker than, than cars. That way people are more inclined to take that mode of transportation. Uh, we have traffic signal timing for events. So when we first got started with this, we actually modeled uh, events um, by using fan-based data. So when the fans purchased season tickets, we had an idea of where they were coming from, and we created heat maps of where folks were driving in from. So whether they're coming in from the Inland Empire or the South Bay, and so we tried to model that traffic coming in and um, program our traffic signals accordingly. Um, what's interesting is models aren't perfect. So as the first game, which was the Rams Chargers, that was one of our most difficult games because you had primarily local uh, people going to it, and they didn't know when to show up. So they all kind of showed up towards right before the kickoff, and a lot of folks didn't get into the bowl because they were still stuck in traffic. And, but what happens is fans learn to actually not come so late. Mm -hmm. They plan their trips accordingly, so fans actually can help the traffic out just by um, you know, not making it to the game on time. Mm -hmm. So we also uh, implement traffic control personnel. We have an agreement with the CHP, which have been fantastic. They understand traffic better than anybody. And then the Sheriff's Department, and then we have traffic control officers at, as well. And then the Inglewood Transit Facility, the ITF, which is that four-acre parcel where we bring shuttle buses in. We do implement a park-and-ride shuttle program via LAS parking. And um, if you want to take this shuttle, you can go to www.iparkandgo, as at the ampersand, go.com. And that'll tell you where you can park and take a shuttle into the stadium and not have to be stuck in traffic uh, as bad. I will say that. But there's two lots off-site. There's one in Westchester and one in El Segundo. And those lots are fantastic. And you can also park at City Hall if parking's available. But you must purchase your tickets online that way there's maybe availability. And then we're also working in conjunction with uh, Torrance, Santa Monica, Big Blue Bus, and Metro, as well as Gardena Transit. So, um, and then as far as the modifications to the TMOP, so the TMOP is a Transportation Management Operations Plan. It is a living document. It is constantly being updated based on lessons learned. And this is an example of the arrival and departure uh, map that shows our arterials coming off the 405, the 105, and even the 110, and um, what major streets folks are coming in from, and also the departures uh, after the event. And what's interesting is it depends on the event, too, because concerts are different than football games. Concerts draw crowds from different areas and mm -hmm. from different cities, mm -hmm. um, and so it's challenging because at the Los Bukis concert, we had a lot of people coming in from the south and from the east of Inglewood. Okay. And mm -hmm. so we had a large concentration of traffic from those areas. Okay. And mm -hmm. so it really backed things up into Lenox and mm -hmm. uh, definitely towards the east and the south. Mm. And this is an example of the, our traffic signal timing, just a general overview. So all of our traffic signals that you see on here, the, the yellow diamonds, um, we control those traffic signals uh, remotely. Mm -hmm. And we also provide timing uh, based on events or even during peak traffic and traffic during the middle of the day. Mm -hmm. uh, we have one of the most state-of-the-art systems uh, in the area. We work closely with Caltrans and um, LADOT to work, uh, and actually the county as well, to try and um, bring traffic in seamlessly. Okay. But during these events, it, it's, it's extremely difficult. Mm -hmm. And this, this is an example of an intersection at Century Boulevard in Prairie, which is one of the most congested intersections during an event. And it just so, shows the conage, signage, and also the, um, the officers that are out there and where they're staged. Mm -hmm. And these 
change as well based on what we see uh, in the field during an event mm -hmm. uh, because, um, you know, it's, it's, it, like I said, it's a living document. Um, uh, Bill Thompson will get into this a little bit later. He's got the next presentation. But as far as neighborhood protection goes, we implemented a citywide permit parking district to keep fans from parking in residential communities. Uh, be, and it should reduce traffic as well because they can't park on these streets. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people have been parking on the streets. We're now starting to implement enforcement. It, it took a, a little while to do that because after you put up the sign, you have to notify that the signs are up and that enforcement will begin in 30 days. And this is, an, this is what the ITF looks like. And um, it's a large parking lot. However, it's perfect for the shuttle buses to drop off and pick up fans and um, concert goers. Mm -hmm. And this was, I believe, the Rams Chargers game where Metro had brought in their buses. And so they're a regular um, feature at the, at the games. They're fantastic. Scott Green at Metro runs the bus lines. And we actually work with Metro, the CHP, the police, uh, the forum, the stadium. After these games on mm -hmm. Tuesdays, we get together and we do a debrief of lessons learned. Oh, wow. And good. they're on the call. It's, mm -hmm. it's, right. it's incredible. I love that. And so what can residents and fans do? Uh, know before you go. I mean, if, you know, if, if there's a, an event, it might be best not to go out before the event mm -hmm. or immediately after the event. By the way, after the event is usually maybe an hour, less than an hour of traffic before the event. It can be a few hours. But um, if you go to uh, the SoFi Stadium website, uh, and I, Jason may have mentioned it, but he mentioned all the, the um, events coming up. But you can go to that website. Uh, there's also envisioninglewood.org, which is a great website for learning about the Inglewood Transit Connector, which is the proposed $1.1 billion ele fully elevated People mover, it could be a monorail, it could be something very similar, but it would essentially connect to the uh, Metro LAX Crenshaw line and bring folks down all the way down to nearly the Clippers Arena. Wow. And That's so, amazing. yes, we're mm -hmm. working on that. We were actually working closely with the federal government to see if we can get funds going through the environmental process with that. And, um, so that's an exciting project. So if you go to that website, you can see uh, what's going on there. Mm -hmm. And also the team op is on there as well. And then Jason mentioned some text messages. We also have a text messaging program where you can sign up and um, get text messages of streets that are congested or are going to be congested or a reminder that there's an event coming up. And we prefer that people sign up for this. Right. So we aren't constantly sending messages to people that weren't planning any trips that day. So we want to make sure that folks um, sign up for it and we're not pushing out too many text messages because then they become unimportant if there's something important mm -hmm. happening. That's true. And then moving forward, um, it's all about learning. We learn the patterns and behaviors of people driving in, where they're parking. We have heat maps of people that are parking in neighborhoods, and so we can enforce them because we do drive around and, right. and see that they're parking in neighborhoods, they're driving through neighborhoods. Uh, the TNC, which is the Uber and Lyft location, so, you know, it's difficult to control where Uber and Lyft are dropping patrons off right. mm -hmm. uh, because what happens is they get stuck in, in traffic and they say, let me out here. Right, you know? exactly. Uh, mm -hmm. It's a little bit more controllable when they're getting picked up and then pedestrians, which are the fans, typically are the hardest to control, and they actually impede traffic the most. Really? How they, is that? They do, because what happens is they'll head to a corner, mm -hmm. but then they'll decide to cross before they get to the crosswalk, mm -hmm. and there will be a movement going on at the intersection, and they'll impede that traffic. Mm -hmm. So what we're trying to do is put in more what they call bicycle uh, fencing Okay. to push pedestrians closer to the crosswalk so that way they can mm -hmm. be controlled and allow the traffic, the vehicular traffic to go through. Mm -hmm. And of course, I mentioned lessons learned, what works, what's not working, 
Where are we getting complaints? Why are we getting complaints? And uh, what we can do to adjust. And those are every week after, they're Tuesdays after uh, the weekend of events. And so that concludes that presentation. Right, right. And then I have another one, but if we want to take a break. Take a couple uh, of yeah, questions. Sure. I will tell you that um, residents, this team, Public Works, is working really hard to um, make sure that they kind of um, eliminate as much of the traffic concerns that we have. And I think that they're trying their best. They're doing a good job. They meet weekly. They learn from the previous weekend's events. And then they just try and make adjustments so that the traffic is better at the next event. And so I want you to know that they are constantly on a weekly basis working for you to improve your your, um, your traffic concerns here in the, in the city. And then also um, he did mention that we do have a new text messaging system. Again, that's cityofinglewood.org forward slash list dot ASPX and that has been implemented to help assist you with any type of traffic concerns that may arise so you can get into that text text messaging system and utilize that as a tool so that when we have events then you're informed and then you don't get caught in any of the traffic so um, and then lastly I will tell you, I'm sure that I'm a resident like all of you. And so I'm sure if I've noticed it, then you guys have noticed it too. I have seen a lot of the bicycle fencing all around the city. And so I think that that has been great. And so I like that they're utilizing that to control the pedestrian traffic. And so also, let me see. I think that we do have one question for you, Lewis. Um, the question is... Why are fans allowed to use residential streets instead of main thoroughfares? I don't know if that is a is a thing, but so yeah, yeah it, it is because okay. what happens is Waze and Google mm -hmm. Maps mm -hmm. and even Apple Maps they see the congestion and they push people, uh, okay. vehicular drivers, onto residential streets. Mm -hmm. So we're working with ways to shut those streets down mm -hmm. on ways right. so right. they don't get pushed into those neighborhoods. And that should help quite a bit. We do put signage up that says residential um, access only. Right. Our signs are getting stolen. Oh. Um, so mm -hmm. if, if residents just want to keep an eye on them and, you know, maybe report to the police that they are getting stolen, mm -hmm. that would be great um, because we are getting those signs stolen as well. But no, our goal is to keep folks off of residential streets, streets. fans. Right. Uh, we're working with the police department to do this as well. Okay. And um, those are kind of the passive measures. Active measures would be police enforcement. Okay. Thank you so much. And we do have one more question. And the question is, what is the plan in the event of an emergency when there's a sold-out event? Do we have an action plan in the event of an emergency at Okay, all? so it depends on the emergency. Okay. But mm -hmm. Emergency vehicles do have access to lanes okay. just for them. Mm -hmm. uh, that way they can get to Sentinella Hospital. Right. Uh, but we do work with, in fact, it's interesting that you bring this up because uh, Dr. Crystal McGlover will be coming up yes. and talking mm -hmm. about COVID. Yes. And she'll be, a part, her team will be a part of, planning for emergencies, evacuations of the stadium, where do the people go? I mean, that's that's in the works right now, but it is it is being brought up and looked at. Okay, great. So those are all the questions. We can go ahead and move through the okay. next part of your presentation. Sure. Mm -hmm. So a bit of good news. Not that the traffic was real bad, but... Um, so the Public Works Department's also uh, responsible for infrastructure. And in the District 4, the Councilwoman's District, uh, we just completed the parking lot at Crenshaw Library. Uh, it was a parking lot that was in very, very bad shape, so we resurfaced it. We replaced damaged sidewalk, curb and gutter, and the driveway approaches as well. We also made it more ADA accessible, mm -hmm. which is not only a requirement by law, but should be um, performed at you know every location that uh, folks want to um, access. And then the construction schedule on that, it was completed in May of 2021. And then there's the residential streets and alleys 
project. It's our largest project for residential neighborhoods. Uh, we resurfaced nearly a little over half a million square feet of pavement, as well as damaged sidewalks, curb and gutter, driveway approaches, and also ADA ramps. And the estimated budget, because the project isn't quite completed yet, it's a little over two and a half million dollars, and it's currently under construction right now. So you may see this construction going on in neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. uh, we do start with first the concrete portion, so we'll fix the sidewalks first, and then we'll come in last and we'll do the pavement. But here's a list of the streets that are um, that either are currently being worked on or will be worked on: Imperial, the Frontage Road, Yukon between Century and Imperial. Cherry between 118th Place and Imperial Highway, Den between the same two streets, 118th Place, um, Den to Crenshaw, 116th Street from Imperial to La Mole, Sims Avenue from Imperial to the south end of the city, as well as 116th and 104th, 116th between Crenshaw and Sims and 104th between Crenshaw and 110th. And that concludes that presentation. And as well. I, I sure, I'm sure that our residents want to know how can they know when a project is going to be starting up and be aware of it so they can plan accordingly. Do you sure. have any um, any information you can provide? Sure. On that? So one of the things that we do is, mm -hmm. I mean, we do on occasion put it out in some of the what's happening reports from the council folks people, but we also um, do um, what is it we. The contractor actually prepares notices and sends them to the residents or drops them off on their doorsteps, okay. letting them know that construction is going to start between this period and that period. Okay. And then as far as parking goes, there's a requirement to put a no parking sign 72 hours before work starts. Okay. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. So we have some good projects happening for District 4, a lot of street a repair happening yes. so I really appreciate that okay. thank you thank you so much for your presentation appreciate you as always thank you appreciate and you. Um, at this time what I'd like to do is bring up Bill Thompson who is also in public works and he is going to go ahead and provide some very important updates <laughs> on our permit parking program. So I know that I receive a lot of questions on this topic. And so I really wanted to make sure that he was a part of this uh, town hall so that you can get your questions answered. And so what I'd like to do is uh, have you get your pen, your paper, write down uh, and take down your notes. And then if you have any questions, Make sure you type them into the chat, and we'll try and get to a few of those questions. We are getting on in time, so I want to be respectful of everybody's time, but we will um, try and answer at least a few questions. At this time, I want to go ahead and turn it over to Mr. Thompson. Thank you so much. Thank you, Councilwoman. Uh, Bill Thompson here with the uh, Parking and Traffic Department, and I'm going to briefly speak about the uh, Residential Permit Parking Program. Uh, the... Uh, Permit program was established by a city council ordinance. And of course, that all took its uh, steam from uh, the community, from community group meetings, block clubs, uh, hearings, uh, special studies, uh, the Parking and Traffic Commission, and of course, city council. Mm -hmm. And of course, the goal of the, uh, the program really is to provide the safety in the, uh, the neighborhoods, uh, protecting the neighborhoods and businesses from the fans and guests attending uh, the Forum, SoFi Stadium, and of course encourage uh, guests and fans uh, going to those venues to use rideshare. And as Lewis talked about, uh, all the the shuttles and park and ride that that are provided. Mm -hmm. um, so tonight I'll just talk briefly about the parking permit program, park and ride, the transit center. I'll, I'll I know you already spoke about it, Lewis, uh, the Public Safety Operations Center, and of course my good friends at the Renaissance and Carlton Square. I work uh, a lot with uh, Yvonne uh, Jackson uh, and Karen Thompson across the street at Carlton Square. In fact, uh, many of the residents down there must remember our hang tag, and, and hopefully <laughs> right. if you don't have one of these, 
you need to get a hold of your homeowners association president and make sure you, you get a hold of one. Now, the residential permit parking program is a new program. With a new program, there's always issues. There's other, always problems. And, and I want the uh, uh, District 4 and the, the city to know that uh, we're constantly listening to your comments. Uh, we're taking a tremendous amount of calls, mm -hmm. uh, the Parking and Traffic Department. I know some of you have waited a few days to get a response. Uh, please be patient and bear with us. Uh, we're getting to those as soon, as soon as we can. I know many of you are applying for the permits online now and need assistance. We're there for that as well. Uh, we can uh, help if you have no computer or you're uh, struggling with that process. We're here to help you with that and can literally do it over the phone. So please uh, contact us and I'll give you some phone numbers at the end. So how does this program work? It's an online process. Mm -hmm. There's three things you need. Proof of where you live, uh, utility bill, something that ties you to that address, uh, your driver's license, and most importantly, a registration that shows that the address on the registration matches the address where you live. That is the most important part of the entire program. The permit program is to assure that the cars on the street belong on the street and they belong to the residents and therefore around the forum and SoFi when those guests and fans come uh, uh, in in the groves and, and many many cars uh, they're looking for a place to park because if you park on property both at SoFi and the forum uh, it's not cheap mm -hmm. and many uh, fans and people coming to the, those venues would rather just get a, a cheap ticket than have to pay what they would have to pay if they drive on the, uh, on the, on the venue property. Uh, of course, two permit passes are, are free. You go online, it's a very simple process uh, to, uh, you know, to get your permits. You'll get a password, and that will be uh, your password to get back into that program in the event that you sell a car, have to update it, uh, change an address, or whatever, that's what that's for. And of course, you do have the two hour free parking uh, between the hours of eight and five. Now, when you look at this, I just want you to ignore the permit fee. As I mentioned earlier, this is a new program. Uh, we're still making adjustments. Uh, we're most interested in making sure that we get those first two permits to you. Uh, there are visitor parking passes, as you can see there. Uh, they're one-day, two-day, three-day weekend passes. They're free. Uh, we accommodate for uh, in-home service providers, housekeepers, babysitters, medical care, and most of these are at no expense. Uh, you've got the college student that's coming back home to, to stay with mom and dad for a while. Uh, these are all uh, situations where we're getting calls about, and we can give you the best information to make sure that it's the... Uh, uh, that this program is for you, the residents, and the last thing anybody wants to do is make it difficult for you to park in, in front of your own house. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a, a uh, email at the bottom there, so there's a phone number too, but I'll give that to you at the end. Um, so the timeline. So it just began in September 1st is when the 30-day period ended, as, as Lewis uh, from Public Works mentioned earlier. So that 30-day notice has already been completed, and we're in phase one. And these are the areas to the west and south of SoFi Stadium and the Forum. These are the, these are the areas that are most affected by uh, uh, fans and guests coming into the venues and parking in the neighborhoods in front of your driveway, double parking, you name it. The second phase uh, will begin uh, on or about October 1st, and that's going to pick up the areas north of the, uh, the Forum and, and east of the Stadium and the Forum. And you'll begin to see the signs uh, going up in your neighborhood, and that will announce that that program is, is coming to you. Uh, just a brief comment about um, these are the venues that we've been speaking about. We've got the Forum of the Hollywood Park, the uh, SoFi Stadium, Hollywood Park Casino, and soon to be the Clippers Arena. And so these are all the venues where all these folks are going to to enjoy their sports and entertainment. Um, 
Of course, how are they coming to Inglewood? We've already talked about that a little bit. Uh, the, the, uh, the one way that people come to these events that are causing us really the most tension and grief are when they drive their cars. Uh, the, uh, Lewis mentioned uh, these, this uh, concert last weekend here attracted uh, uh, 50, 60,000 guests. And we felt pretty good that we were able to get five to 6,000 people each night of that concert to leave their cars at a off-site parking location and let us shuttle them into the venue. Uh, there are some uh, city-owned uh, parking uh, locations where we're accommodating guests and fans, and uh, this map here shows those. Uh, we've got City Hall, the library. Uh, on Locust Street, there's the uh, Senior Center and the Locust Parking Structure. And then, of course, we've got a couple of other sites as well. So these are when you go on iPark and Go and uh, to make sure that you get your spot to park, these are some of the most local locations that you might be able to get a spot. And then, again, we shuttle you right to the venue. Uh, Lewis mentioned the, uh, the transit facility where all the buses pick up uh, folks, and uh, they're, they're coming in from off sites like Playa Vista, and over nearby the airport, and then we, we bust them in right to, the, uh, to this transit facility, which literally you get off the bus and you walk maybe, what, 40, 50 feet, and boom, you're in the stadium. Um, these are some uh, metro locations and shuttle services that surround the, uh, the venues. Uh, uh, I will say that our metro transit, they've been real great partners for us in helping us to, uh, to get uh, fans and guests into these venues. Uh, that's the bus routes, of course, and there's quite a few around uh, the entertainment district. And these are some of the things that were mentioned uh, from overhead signs to uh, portable signage. Uh, it was mentioned that uh, it's a good idea when you're coming home from work and you know there's an event coming up. These message boards will be uh, on the roadways as you uh, you know, head home and uh, make, a, make a note of what you read there, and it'll give you an idea of what's coming up at either the forum or SoFi. Here's a couple of uh, important phone numbers for you to take if you don't have these. Uh, the first one is the parking permit program. Now, I know in the last few days uh, when you do call, uh, you don't get an actual person right now, but there is voicemail, and we will get back with you and help you with your questions and make sure that you get your permits. Uh, Tanya Perry, Tanya Eileen, long time uh, employees here at the City of Inglewood. Their numbers are there. They're supervisors with me in the parking and traffic department and that's my direct number on the, uh, the bottom. And, and Lori, I know that we're gonna make sure that we get that out so that uh, you have access to that and can provide that to anybody contacting you uh, that's the end of my presentation, and if you had any specific really, questions you wanted to mention. That was really, really helpful. Thank you so much, um, Bill, for providing that information. We do get bombarded with a lot of questions. Residents want to know what the parameters will be for the parking, uh, permit parking. So that was helpful. And right now what I want to do is um, have you answer just a couple of questions. Certainly. Uh, the first one is, I will read it. Uh, it says, why $100 for parking permit costs for the residents beyond two cars? How was that cost justified? And um, where is the money going? So I don't know if um, we have a response yet as far as like the the fees, how they'll be allocated towards the city. But if you want to address that, if you know, and then um, how do we come up with um, $100 for each pass, for the annual pass? Certainly. Well, I, I will say that, uh, as I mentioned earlier, that um, uh, this is a new program. And there's a lot of things that we're learning from the program. And we're taking the feedback from the, uh, the residents and still tweaking and making some adjusts, uh, adjustments. As of this moment, nobody has been charged $100 for a third or fourth uh, permit. As I mentioned, the two are free. And if uh, a resident calls in and says, gee, I, I need a third permit or I need a fourth permit, uh, we tell them to just go right back online and apply for that permit. Get into the system, 
and um, it, it will recognize that this is a third or fourth permit, and the uh, Public Works Department reviews those, and by the time that we begin to review uh, those that needed more than two, uh, they will decide on, you know, what that, uh, what the fee is going to be eventually and address that. So that's just kind of down the road a little bit, but uh, nobody yet has been charged uh, any fee for the, uh, the third and fourth permit. And frankly, um, I don't know, Lewis, I, I can't think, I, I think it's really under 100 maybe that have uh, call, uh, called and asked that they maybe would need a third permit. Did you want to comment on that? Sure. I mean, it, it's important that folk, people that, residents that um, apply for the third and fourth permit, they have to prove that the third and fourth permit are, are needed. That's the most important part. Um, they can register up to four cars, but they're only allowed two cars on the street. Um, if they have a driveway, they can drive, you know, they can park the other two cars, but if People, if residents are, um, if they live at the house and their driver's license is registered to the house and the car is registered to the house, then they, you know, they have a, um, they can apply for the third and fourth permit. And the other thing I was going to mention too is uh, we have discussions with the residents when they call in and believe they need a third or fourth permit. And many occasions we'll find that they really don't. Uh, we'll talk to them about where you park in, do you park in the garage, do you have a driveway, and sometimes at the end of the conversation, you know, we all realize that, you know, gee, you don't really need a third permit. Mm -hmm. uh, but there's uh, that, that feeling that, gee, I need to get as many as I can. Mm -hmm. uh, and when you realize that maybe you not, may not need uh, uh, any more than two, and uh, if it is a, uh, like an adult child that's coming back and uh, the father may park his car in the garage, that third permit may become the second permit for the adult child. So, uh, but we, we work that out with you. We talk it out through you uh, to make sure that uh, what you really need uh, gets into the system and so that public works can approve it. But I encourage everybody that, that feels they need another one to just go ahead and apply for it. And uh, soon those decisions will be made about uh, issuing those third and fourth permits. Okay, and we have another question. Uh, the question is, why are the permits restricted to the parking zone where you live and not good citywide? Well, uh, so the parking permit, if you live in a particular zone, that's for your particular street and in front of your house. Mm -hmm. um, the, um, we have had occasions where uh, people will call and say, well, gee, you know, I go over to my friend's house every afternoon and uh, park in front of their house, you know, would that permit be good for that location? And, and, it, and it would not, but through discussion with the residents, we usually can work through that and find that, gee, if you do go over there every day and you're, there's just a limited amount of room to maybe park in a driveway, mm -hmm. why don't that resident park, your friend park in the street and you take the driveway? Mm -hmm. So we try and spend some time kind of working through right. what, their, what their intent is to get them through any issues where they feel there might be uh, a problem, you know, as far as navigating around the city and parking. Okay. And then I have one last question before we let you go, because we're running short on time here. But um, we do get a lot of questions regarding if a resident is having maybe a birthday party at their house on a Saturday night, or I don't know, a, br a, a baby shower, or a graduation party. Do we have any direction on how we're going to handle those yet, or is that still being decided? Or no, no, that uh, we can help with that. Um, so that uh, the phone number the, the, that end in five that ends in five three nine eight. Mm -hmm. So if you've got an event coming up on the weekend, if you give us a day or two notice, and you call that number, we'll get back with you, mm -hmm. and you'll explain to us, uh, you know, what your event is, mm -hmm. and uh, we'll make sure that. Uh, We'll have the discussion with you and find out what we need to do to kind of avoid cause any, any problem to your event at, at your home. So, yes, we have plans for that. Okay. And we'll make sure that uh, whatever event you're planning and you've got friends coming over, you can have that event and we're all behind you and we'll make sure everybody's able to park in front of your house. Right. 
Okay. Thank you so much for your okay. presentation, Bill. Thank I really you. appreciate it. And um, as you exit, what I want to do is I want to remind residents. So if you have any more questions regarding the uh, permit parking, then you can reach out to our parking permit program. The number there again is 310-412-5398. Again, that's 310-412-5398. And they will walk you through any questions that you have and um, make sure that you have a good understanding of the upcoming permit parking program. So I want to thank Bill Thompson again for his informative presentation. I want to thank uh, Lewis Atwell, our director of public works, on his um, presentation as well. And so with that, we have just a couple more. And we're, we're coming into the home stretch, but this has been really good information. And so um, right now what I want to do is I want to introduce Christopher Jackson. He is the Director of Economic and Community Development, and he will provide some really good information on the TOD. I have seen a lot uh, some of the questions and and comments and the interest in that. So he will uh, address that for us this evening. So right now what I wanna do is turn it over to Mr. Christopher Jackson for his presentation. Thank you so much for being here. You're welcome. Thank you, Councilwoman Falk. The opportunity to speak to the uh, town hall residents it's, it's always been my, my honor. Many of you probably watching this have seen me over the years mm -hmm. talk to you about the various issues that we have in the city. So I'll try and kind of cut through things. I have a few areas I want to be able to discuss with you in addition to the TOD, and I do want to kind of, I'll move that along very quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, but again, I'm Christopher uh, Jackson, uh, the Director of Economic and Community Development. Uh, I, I cover basically four divisions. I have the Economic Development Division, the Planning Division, Building Safety Division, and the Code Enforcement Division. All right, so the meat of why we're here, talking about the TOD. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things I wanted to, you know, we just recently had a, a series uh, of uh, community meetings that occurred uh, mostly in the 2019 range. We ran into 2020 with the COVID situation and all of the issues that were going there. And then we picked up after we got through some of our other major projects, which have been, uh, um, I, hopefully everybody's excited about them. I know I am with SoFi Stadium and all the activities that are going on with the Clippers and the new arena and whatnot. And so one of the things that we were r really concerned about uh, in, in working in partnership with uh, Metro was really uh, about what was going to happen in and around the station location. So our Metro stops, um, how we we're going to um, facilitate opportunities for in increased uh, development potential in those areas to take advantage of the, the, the Metro transit system. Right. And so uh, in that, there were essentially Two, we did. We already had um, gone through two TODs. We did our Fairview Heights, we did our downtown Inglewood, uh, and they've been rave successes. For those you've seen some of the things that have been going on with the Link Housing uh, project on Fairview Heights, with the uh, Inglewood Gateway, um, with Thomas Safran and Associates. All of those were spurred on by uh, the uh, vision of the TOD. So, so what is a TOD? TOD is a transit-oriented design uh, plan. There's some specific things, transit-oriented development plan and design gui guidelines. So it's, it's really a design study. It is um, it's a study that kind of creates a vision. And I worked for a number of cities that had amazing visions for what they were going to be doing in and around certain areas. This is a vision for the areas around the metro stops. So in your particular um, uh, district, you have the Crenshaw Imperial yes. uh, design. So uh, it was a little bit interesting because there's actually one for two, and I'll discuss uh, uh, that in a second, but they're, they're kind of distinctly separate because they deal with different land use patterns. Mm -hmm. So this is kind of the cover of what it looks like, and uh, those of you who have been able to see it online, you can go to cityofingwood.org and come to the Economic and Community Development, and you can see these plans. Um, so there is the Westchester Veterans in District 3, mm -hmm. uh, Councilman uh, Morales, and then there's the Crenshaw Imperial in District 4. Now, what was causing the problem? Okay, let's talk. <laughs> uh, what, what happened was, uh, as part of the, the Metro's uh, standard uh, way of addressing transit-oriented development and design, they look at a half-mile 
uh, radius around the transit stops. Okay. So part of our agreement with them, and they funded a large portion of these plans, so this is not coming out of Inglewood money. It's coming mostly out of Metro money. Right. So we were able to secure funding to do these plans and help us vision these particular areas. And as a result of that, around these, um, these particular um, stations, there is residential. And so when we drew the map and we, we did our outline, we include the residential areas or, that were within uh, uh, a half a mile walking of those transit locations. Now, we knew that even with doing that, we intended never to, uh, to, to really change anything about those, but they were included in the plan because it gave us opportunity to talk, kind of deal on things like complete streets, mm -hmm. talk about access way, you know, and some of the things I'm going to talk about with all, all, alternate uh, modes of transportation. Mm -hmm. uh, but we heard the community loud and clear. Mm -hmm. And so what we did was we went back to our uh, consultant, the, um, the Arroyo Group, mm -hmm. and they, uh, we said, let's, and we talked with Metro too, and they're still looking through some aspects of it. Mm -hmm. But we said, since none of the real underlining zoning in the, those residential, those R1 and R2 zones, mm -hmm. uh, we're going to change. Let's just take them out. Right. There's no confusion about it. Right. It's very clear. Let me, let me say this. Primarily for TOD type designs, mm -hmm. it's really about those major corridors right. and those corner areas that have the opportunity to be able to increase in, in density. So we did a quick little you know, question and answer. So I'll kind of run through a, a few of those. Uh, question, will the zoning change in the R1 and R2 areas? Answer, no. The R1 and R2 zone parcels, they've been removed. Right. So those of you who have R1 and R2, those single family homes there, don't worry about it. We, right. we address those. Mm -hmm. Now, when you get into the more the multifamily, we did leave those in okay. because there is opportunities to kind of rethink some of the types of developments that are in there. So we included those in there to take advantage of some of the new standards. So is the city going to take my property? No. Oh. Yeah, we're not taking your property. There's no eminent domain. We're not coming in. We're not taking anything. Out. And we never were going to do that from the beginning. That right. never was the idea. And as I said before, many of these plans, when you start talking about these plans, these are plans that look at 10, 15, 20 years down the road. Right. They're not necessarily things that are going to happen right now. But what it does is it lays kind of the, the construct, if you will, for moving our city towards that, uh, that next level of, of um, opportunity in, in, within the city. Yeah. It gives them a vision. Mm -hmm. And those of you know, you know, without vision, the people perish. So right. there's a little mm -hmm. old saying about that. <laughs> So, um, so was, why, was, why was my property included in the plan area? I think I answered that because of the circumference around there, you know. Is the city going to do any kind of physical developments? Uh, the city itself? No, we're not. We're setting the standards to allow the private market, by and large, to come in to be able to do some of the things, some of the great things we see, like the Inglewood Gateway Project like the Fairview, Fairview Heights project and many other projects that we're excited about that are going to be coming, coming online. Right. Will the inclusion of our property in the plan affect my property taxes? No. <laughs> <laughs> no. If approved, the TOD plans will not affect single-family residential property owners. It won't su uh, supersede Proposition 13. And most importantly, because we took it out, it really won't affect right. it. Now, those of you who own multifamily property, commercial property or whatnot, then those properties are not going to be affected by this plan. Mm -hmm. uh, as you develop it, it will, but not by this particular plan. Is the city building affordable homes in a plan area? No. There's a theme going on here. Right, I hope you right. pick it up. Mm -hmm. We don't have any current plans to build any affordable housing. However, right. here's one of the things that the plan does allow for. It allows for the inclusion of affordable units. Mm -hmm. It actually, it actually uh, sets for a vision to okay. make sure we do that. And we have a number of things we already have in place that we use with projects to make sure we get affordable units in, in, all, in these projects. And as you know, most of the projects, residential projects that are coming up in the city right now have an affordable component, component with it. So we are certainly looking to give individuals opportunity who are you know, you know, challenged in the area of, of affordability to be able to stay here in the great city of Inglewood. The other thing I want to talk about was the active transportation plan. Now, this is something I, mm -hmm. I know is not on the menu, but I put it in there right. because it's cool. So, Go for it. Go uh, for it. And since I, mm -hmm. I ride bikes to work, yeah. generally speaking, and I rode today, by the way, so I'll be riding home at night. Oh, Anybody out there on the road, I, don't I, hit I me. I'll give you a ride. No, if you see it's me going late. fast down La Brea, <laughs> don't hit me. Um, 
But we're really excited about the active transportation plan because one of this, uh, some of what we, we're talking about, all these sports and all this stuff, we need to create a network of opportunity for people to be able to bike and to walk and to get out and get active in this environment. As a matter of fact, it's interesting because when you look at the statistics of COVID, and this was a, a really amazing thing, mm -hmm. throughout 2020 when mm -hmm. folks were hunkered down, I was out riding my bike up and down roadways, and, and you know, it was one of the least opportunities to get exposed. Oh, yes. yeah. That's and true. so it's, it's one of the lowest area. ways where right. you can actually be out actively engaged and you get some of that exercise in. Right. So it, so what does it do? It improves access, increases public transit uh, connections to the rest of the LA region. Mm -hmm. The goal is to promote improvements and encourage the community to walk, bike, take a bus, use the transit that we're talking about, take advantage of the system, get out of the car. Right. experience this beautiful city that we have. And then it talks about improvements that will elevate the attractiveness of the community. I was recently in Newport uh, Beach, and they have uh, a Fashion Island, and they have all these beautiful walkways that you, you're riding bikes around, and you're traversing, and you're talking, and you see people out and, and, and engaging each other in a different, in a different way. And the, and the cars kind of move to the background because it's so beautiful out there. So we certainly want to do those things to help. Mm -hmm. It's a quick little plan, not very readable, but it gives you the network connection. Those of you who ride uh, bikes or, or you move throughout the city, you want those pathways to be clear. You don't want obstacles. You want to get by a car. Mm -hmm. You want to make sure you have those things. We, we do the walk to school uh, right. that we've done for several years. Mm -hmm. Bike to school that we've done for several years. These are the things that get folks out of the cars and we were just talking about people parking on the street and right. permits and all that yes, stuff yes. so we want we want folks to to get active yes. um the other thing that i i, I mentioned i was going to talk about is code enforcement yes uh and code enforcement it, it really it really is about a quality neighborhood mm -hmm. and so this graphic that you see talks about kind of the responsibility trimming your trees cutting your hedges making sure your sidewalk is clear i'm out there in my neighborhood all the time with my little blower blowing all the little it's electric, by the way. It's not gas. Oh, okay. So right. and, and it's quiet. <laughs> so lecture is quiet. I saw the way you guys were looking at me. Um, and my neighbors, we all engage in that, making sure that we keep the neighborhood clean. And so for those of you out there in District 4, you have a responsibility to keep your neighborhoods clean. Mm -hmm. Don't let the clutter take out. The, get the trash out of there. Mm -hmm. Cut your grass. Right. You know, get out there with a bucket of paint. Go to Home Depot. We have two of them in the city of Inglewood. Right. Buy some paint and paint your houses. Mm -hmm. You actually could do that yourself. Mm -hmm. There's not a law against you getting out there. and It may not look great. I understand. But at least yeah. you can um, put a, a skim of coat of paint on top of your home. So that's very, very important. Um, and so one of the things that we've been talking about in the, in the district is this issue of unpermitted street vendors. Mm -hmm. You know, we got street vendors going in there. Mm -hmm. And so we've hunkered down with uh, me and my code enforcement staff, Mr. Jerry Tucker, who's the uh, code enforcement manager doing a fantastic job. Right. We're, we're looking at how we can address these issues from a strategic standpoint. Um, and let me tell you, your councilwoman will call us all the <laughs> time. She, she calls me, she calls Jerry, she calls whoever she needs to call because she understands that she is accountable to you, the constituents of, of District 4, and she wants to make sure she gets ahead of it. So we really appreciate that dialogue we're able to have mm -hmm. and how we're able to get ahead of these issues in, in advance, making sure that SoFi cuts their grass, right? Right. <laughs> right. We got that under control. We get, we get that under control. Those of you know, being yeah. a good... And then also the, just, just those responsibilities. And we put a, a couple of pictures in here. We, we just love what Marvin Engineering does with their site. It's so pristine. They take care of it. And that's what kind of a standard we try and apply to all of our business owners. Um, so with that, um, mm -hmm. I am available for questions. And congratulations, so great. Council really Woman Really appreciate Paul. your presentation. I think that we do have a couple of questions here. Hold on. I'm pulling them up now. Okay. Uh, let's see. Uh, okay, so this is a question on a different subject. I don't know if you want to touch the, on this right now. You can try. Briefly, but it's the question is, what is Inglewood doing about Airbnb? Good old Airbnb. <laughs> um, we, we actually, believe it or not, we actually put forth an ordinance on Airbnb it went to the Planning Commission. They reviewed it. It, it was transferred over to the council. And in the council's wisdom, wisdom, 
there were a number of issues that were missing out of there. I think one of the big things was individuals who want to be able to take advantage of it. They didn't want it to be uh, overly uh, concentrated, but they wanted to be able to take advantage of it. And one of the things we hear the mayor and the council say is, hey, look, Super Bowl is going on and I'm not a football fan. Why not take advantage of that and go wherever I'm going to go and get out of town? Why can't I do that? Mm -hmm. So we, right. we made a number of adjustments to it. And then what we've done, because of housing protection, uh, who's over, uh, Ms. Uh, uh, Yakima Decatur is, is over that, yes. we transferred that because it is a portion of issue of housing protection right. involved in that as well. Mm -hmm. So, and, and it's a sensitive uh, subject because right. we don't want to displace residents. We, right. we don't want investors just to be able to come in and, and, and buy up our homes and use them for Airbnb right. because of our venues. Right. So we've been very careful with that, but it is going to be coming forward. Mm -hmm. Now, the good news is we're not going to say no to Airbnb outright, but we are going to craft some real creative standards right. so the individual property owners can take advantage of it. And at the same time, we keep those neighborhoods intact so they don't become something else. So. I like that. And so um, because we have a lot of questions on the TOD, sure. is there a way for our residents to kind of read more information? You were actually, you provided great information and answered a lot of those very important Absolutely. questions. But if there's any additional information, where is the best way for our residents to access that information? Yeah, the, the best way is you can actually, you can go online. Uh, mm -hmm. We are going to be, you can go online to cityofinglewood.org, mm -hmm. come to my department, Economic and Community Development. Uh, go to planning, and you can see all the plans are up. Okay. There, there is a and A. I'm putting some final pin to <laughs> right. that'll be up on the website um, on Tuesday. Okay, and so and then you'll be able to see some of these questions answered. The other thing is you can call our offices at 310-412-5230. three zero five two three zero. That's our planning division mm -hmm. headed by Miss uh, Mindy Wilcox. And their staff, Bernard McCrumby, who's kind of over this, will be able to answer any question you have. You can email them as well, and access to the email is on, you're available online as well. Okay. So. All right, great. And then um, also, I know that we get some code enforcement questions, and you're over code enforcement. Yeah. And so I was just wondering if you could provide, you might not have it off the top of your head, what is the best way if our residents see something, you know, you see something, you say something, right? right. And they want to say something to the city of Inglewood. They want to let us know. What's the best way for them I, to do I, that? Actually, it's very easy. You can go to the website again. Okay. Go to the code enforcement section. Okay. The access number is there. And then there's also a citizen portal that you can actually go to. When you go to the website, there's a citizen por portal where you can just make, if you see something that you want to get into the system, you can lodge it there. You can do it anonymously so you don't have to put your name um, unless you want to. Sometimes we encourage that because we want to be able to communicate with you and let you know that these things are in action. Um, um, because sometimes we do get people, re they'll call back. I called yesterday and the, the trash can is still out there. Oh, well, we, we've gone out. We've let them know they need to remove it, et cetera. So, yeah, they can access the, the website for that as well and contact the Code Enforcement Division to answer those questions. That's great. I think that is it. Okay. A wonderful presentation. Lots and lots of information. You got lots of questions answered as well. So we appreciate you as always. Thank you. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Councilwoman. All right. I hope that everyone was paying attention to that because I know my office has received several questions on the TOD. So um, thank you so much, Christopher Jackson, for coming on and answering those questions. And if you have any more questions, residents, you can get in contact with our office. We can point you to the direction of where you can get additional information, or you can go to where Mr. Jackson directed you to as well. Um, with that said, we have a presentation, our last presentation of the evening, of the evening, and it is Miss Crystal McGovern. She will be giving updates on the emergency preparedness in, um, developments, and I want to thank her for being the last, but certainly not the least. Um, thank you so much for your patience. We appreciate you, and I'm going to go ahead and turn the floor over to you right now for your updates. Thank you. First off, I would like to thank you for allowing our department for, to come and share our information about emergency preparedness mm -hmm. because it, essentially we want to make sure that uh, residents are prepared for disasters, helping their families, helping their loved ones, their neighbors, and their community. Right. So thank you again for that. You're welcome. And so tonight 
we're going to discuss COVID-19 updates as well as new highlights from what OES is doing. So starting off with LA County, as of Monday, August 23rd, 2021, at 11.59 p.m., there was a new health officer order that was um, updated. And including in that update was information on information on mega events as well as youth sports events. So beginning September 20th, 2021, all attendees at indoor mega events involving a thousand or more persons must prior to entry show verification of COVID-19 vaccination status or a negative COVID-19 test result. This is a lower attendance threshold than the previous requirement, which is at 5,000 participants. It also clarifies that for indoor mega events, um, self attestation is no longer a permitted method for vaccination, verification, or a negative test. You have to prove that and mm -hmm. show your vaccination card or your test. Right. It also requires the view sports that change. Because of the higher cases and rates, mm -hmm. there's notice of higher case rates in youth sports. So mm -hmm. they changed that. And that's also in Appendix X, at S, which you can find on the LA County Public Health website. Mm -hmm. The health officer order and appendixes are all on the public health website as well. Mm -hmm. So just to give you a few highlights on Appendix S, which is the sports, under the new order, routine testing will be required for all athletes and, and staff participating in moderate or high-risk sports, regardless of vaccination status. Those include football, basketball, baseball, cheerleading, tennis, and soccer, and among others. COVID-19 testing is provide, you have to do COVID-19 testing as well. Uh, staff, coaches, and volunteers must show their vaccination status on a weekly basis, as well as testing compliance to make sure that everyone is safe. Um, exceptions are athletes in water sports, such as uh, swimming and water polo. They don't have to wear their mask at all. Hmm. And other information regarding LAUSD, um, they've had increase in infection rates. So they started uh, like a week ago. COVID-19 cases led to miss school days for 6,500 LAUSD students during the first week back. And with that, to find out more information on COVID-19 school report card, there's a dashboard you, that you can look at weekly um, testing results from student, for students, staff, as well as number of people, um, those that need to be tested, the students that need to be tested within the county. Mm -hmm. So you can look at a certain district. So regarding Inglewood, there are currently There are currently 16,097 cases, and within the last week, there, within the last 14 days, there's been 540 cases for, within the 14 days. And also, it, there's 327 deaths in Inglewood right now. 327? Yes, mm -hmm. total. Seven within the last 14 days. If you need to get vaccinated, you can get vaccinated um, you could go to the uh, My Vaccination website or LA County website to get vaccinated. Mm -hmm. Or you can also, they have an opportunity where you can get vaccinated at home between 8 and 8 a.m. and 8.30 p.m. at any day of the week. Just ask for assistance. Call 1-833-540-0473. And also, if you need information related to public health or anything, you can also dial 211, which is the LA County Public Health line. So information and highlights with the Office of Emergency Services. Right now, we're on, we have ongoing coordination with the LA Super Bowl host committee and public safety partners to ensure a safe and successful Super Bowl. We've had weekly meetings regarding that. We want to make sure that our residents are safe. We are also remodeling our emergency operations center with new technology improvements that can ensure that we help, help with emergencies and major disasters and throughout event, events in our region. And we're, 
The city's new emergency operation plan is in final phase of review with completion date as of anticipated for October 2021. The local hazard mitigation plan kickoff has commenced with a planned completion date of April 2022. This is a FEMA required plan that develops mitigation strategies for both natural and man-made threats to the community. So we will also have community engagement involved as well as local businesses. On October 21st, there will be a shakeout drill. That's when you drop, cover, and hold on when, during an earthquake. And you, we want our different schools to participate, homes, organizations, and just make sure that everyone knows what to do during an earthquake. Also, we have ongoing incident and EOC management training for our staff here at the city of Inglewood and um, our leadership. So regarding emergencies, I know that was mentioned earlier and what to do in an emergency. Mm -hmm. We have an Alert South Bay, which is the system, an emergency notification system that one can use and opt into to receive emergency notifications for the city. So you can opt in Inglewood, Inglewood Alerts. You could go to Inglewood Alerts, text Inglewood Alerts to 888777. In an event of an emergency or disaster, you can, we will send out an alert and you'll be able to get that information. And again, it is Ingle Alerts, I-N-G-L-E, alerts to 888-777. And finally, if you have any questions related to emergency preparedness or would like flyers, brochures, emergency preparedness videos, videos for your children, you could look at our website, information on what to put in a kit. Um, you could look at our website, City of Officer Emergency Services. You could contact us mm -hmm. and follow us on Ready Inglewood. We have Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter as well. So ultimately, we want to make sure that our citizens and our residents are safe in our city. And anything that we can do to help with that, we're there to help. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much, Crystal. That was very helpful. Um, I was sad to hear the, the statistics regarding the deaths in Inglewood at 327. So um, hopefully folks are going out and getting vaccinated. I know we have several vaccination sites right here in Inglewood. Yes, there's still one at the form as well. Okay. And you can, there's, those are a walk up. Right. So we want to encourage all of our Inglewood residents to go out and please get vaccinated, protect yourself, protect your family and we can limit the number of deaths that's happening in L.A. County and specifically in Inglewood. So um, I don't have any other questions for you, but that was great information. Appreciate you. Thank you. And thank you Appreciate so much you. for thank hanging out. And, and presenting. I know you're the last one, so I want you to know I really appreciate your That's time fine. and Thank staying you. around. Thanks, Thanks so much, Crystal. All right. So we had some great information here, Inglewood. I hope you appreciated it. I know it's a little long. We went for two hour, two and a half hours. And um, I didn't really anticipate going that long, but I feel like it was some really great information for you. I hope that you wrote down a lot of the information that we provided. You can always feel free to um, contact my office if you want follow-up um, you know, numbers or, e or website addresses or you have any questions. And um, what I like to do is uh, allow you to take an opportunity to write down the information to contact my office. Uh, we are at City Hall, and you can contact my assistant directly at lpenix at cityofinglewood.org, or you can call 310-412-8605. We do have social media. Please look for us on Facebook, Instagram. We have everything. So please connect with us. Um, and make sure that you get all the information for District 4. We also have a newsletter that goes out monthly that has a lot of updates and information for you as well. And with that, that will conclude our District 4 Town Hall this evening. Thank you so much for hanging in there with us. I hope you enjoyed it, and I'll see you again. We are anticipating our next town hall will be in the spring of 2022. Until then, I will talk to you uh, very soon. 
You be safe out there. Get vaccinated. Protect you. Protect your family. And we'll see you soon. Thank you.